one. You're on the air, everybody. Welcome. It is Artist on Record, your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. And who do we have in the hot seat tonight? I'll tell you in one second. But make sure you subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified so you don't miss any other episodes. Also, join our All Access VIP Backstage Pass in Patreon. Because this week in Patreon, that's right, in Patreon, we're going to have over here a couple of cool people here. Janice Ian, Holly Knight. It's going to be really cool, and you're going to love it. If you love rock and roll, you'll love the stories that these ladies are going to share with us. But that's all in Patreon. You'll see a lot of it there, and you'll see some of it like that here. That's not sexual. It's just some of it here. But anyway, I am Stefan. You are beautiful. It's Artist on Record. And today we're going to do top five live, live with our buddy James right here. And you know what? We're going to bring him on in about two minutes and two seconds. Don't touch that dial. It all starts now, you wild kids. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, everybody. Welcome. And you know what? I'm going to bring James Kotek right here in the studio right now. There he is. Let's bring him in here. Welcome, James. Welcome, hey. man. I, you I know, got a voice change. You got, <laughs> yeah. you got a voice change. You know, I'll give you a proper introduction, man, because for the people that are watching and just tuning in, you know, a lot of people might know of you and some of the stuff that you've done in the past, like your band Kingdom Come and you had a band Wild Horses. You also... You played with Montrose, you played with mm -hmm. the Scorpions, but I remember you from the band Crunk that you played with Glam Nation on Melrose in Hollywood. I remember it just like yesterday, because and you you and some guys, that, but and Eric Singer was on drums. That's right. That's that was right. A great band. That's right. We had a fun time playing the Glam Nation yeah. band and you guys' band. It was it was you with with your wife. It was uh, who was in the band back then in Crunk. Um, you know what? We had a, a revolving door, but Rick Steyer, I'm sorry, my computer was fine. My, That's okay. Rick Steyer, my longtime partner and friend, uh, was in the band for a while. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I, I, we had different guys. A guy, we had a guitarist named Dave. If it was a bald guy, it was Dave. And if it was a hair, guy with hair, it was Rick. And okay. then we had a couple of different bass players. You had a different bass player, but you never asked me. All right, I'll fix your argument, James. <laughs> James, I have a picture of the bass. Okay, so tell me who's in the lineup right here in this picture. That oh, um, from left to right, looking at the picture, that's John. Oh, yeah, John Lucas was the guitarist for a while. And he'd gone to school with, or his wife went to school with Athena. And then there's yours truly with a horrible haircut. And then uh, Athena, and then that was uh, Price. And oh, God, was his, he was from Oklahoma and he was great, man. And, and if, if anybody looked at us the wrong way, he was the first guy to step in. He's always really? okay. Really, really cool picture with the guitar you got there. Is that the um, dime? Which, which guitar is that? that you're playing? You know, I always played Explorers. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I was with uh, Yamaha for years. And then uh, I kept running into the, the, the main rep from, from Dean uh, and, and, uh, PD and Dean guitars and, and I play, I, he kept going man join D drum because they were all one company and I go ah you know because their drums were okay they weren't they weren't like Yamaha or anything yeah. but the whole Yamaha staff changed overnight and I was like hmm hmm okay so if I go with D drum and their partners with PV and Dean guitars, hmm, because I play guitar, and yeah. so my little plan worked. It, and uh, it, so I was with Dean for for I still am technically, and uh, man, they made me some custom explorers that were they're great. A lot of people say they don't say very many good things about Dean, but I think they're great. And uh, I agree. Yeah, I agree. They made an acoustic bass that I actually have, and I love it. It actually was yeah. a gift that somebody gave me. And it was, I wouldn't even think about buying them. And I still have it to this day. And it's one of my favorite um, instruments to have here. But everybody's That's in cool. the chat. I got all the ladies, you know, saying hi to you. And even our buddy Steve over here. Well, hey, Steve, thank you over here. Debbie says hi. Tara hey. says hi. Everybody's saying hi to you. So hello, thank you all for, for being in here. And um, questions you have, we'll get to it, everybody. Make sure you. Keep the chat going on. Talk some among yourself and uh, tell us your top five. But you know what? We are going to talk with James about 
his top five here tonight. And I did some homework here. Usually we do this in Patreon, but I figured this was, you know what? Let's go live and see what we could do and, and okay. have fun with it. And then I'll re-edit this out. So this episode that everybody's watching, it might not stay up here forever. It might be edited down. But for right now, you guys are here to enjoy what it would be like in VIP All Access Patreon. And also, I'm going to do a little plug here because I got Holly Knight this Wednesday and Patreon. That'll be, uh, she'll be there at 10 a.m. She's big. She wrote a lot of great songs, huh, James? Oh, my God. I, she, I, 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 I think I, I might have mentioned this to you in passing. I think at one point, this is no, no exaggeration, she had 17 songs that she had written or co-written in the top 200 on Billboard chart uh, when she had heart go. I mean, God, she wrote for everybody and everything. Ragdoll, Tina Turner, the best. Well, I that's think she right. Wrote. Yeah. Love is a battlefield for Pat Benatar. God. She wrote a couple, you know, a couple for a couple of little people. Picture just, yeah. picture just saying under the belt, like, you know, oh, I, I wrote for Pat Benatar, Tina Turner. It's like Tina Turner. Let's like, that's rock and roll history. Man, I, I, dude, I saw uh, Tina Turner live at the Greek Theater in LA. Man, she was phenomenal. It was one of the best shows, I think. It's it's in my top five best shows I've ever seen. Really? She was Tina. Tina, huh? Yeah, Tina Turner. God, I remember there was a place in North Hollywood called Nats, Nate, and uh, yeah, not too, yeah, and Ike Turner used to eat there, and his picture was always on the wall just when he was alive. Because I, I think supposedly he lived around there, so I would go to. They had great breakfast. It was like on Van Nuys. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, and, I know. Uh, great place. And but I look at the picture. I go, oh, he's gonna walk in here any second. I'm gonna see <laughs> Ike Turner. But never came in there. But I would always try to look at the stare at the picture because it was one of his joints there. And then right. we got the legendary at 17, Janice Ian will be here on Friday. And I got her gonna be, it's gonna be in Patreon. So I'll be putting the links up there for you guys in Patreon to watch the interviews live with these women of rock and roll and legends of rock. Wait, when is that? Uh Friday, I have her. What Friday, I do is okay. yeah, I do I do a <laughs> yeah, today what's today? Oh, today's Sunday. Monday, today's Sunday. All day. Yeah. Today is Sunday, and then unless we're in different countries, and you know, don't get don't get me twisted here, you know. But anyway, we're gonna talk with James over here, and I did a top five. We're gonna do your top five must-have albums already right now with James Kotek. He's right here, and uh, you know what? Not only you play, it's like you're one of those cats that plays everything. You're excellent drumming wise, incredible drummer, but then well, you, you sing, you play thank guitar, you. yeah, and. Uh, Look how you Farrah Fawcett me now. You do a little of this and you. <laughs> yeah, man. My, the, the, the guitar, I, I, always, I could never play that thing, man. And I've got, I said, man, one day I've got to really buckle down and do it. And my friend, because I write all kinds of stuff. And then I'd go to Rick Steyer and he translated for me, basically, and soup it up and make it sound incredible. So it sounded like I wrote all this stuff. And I wrote all the basics of the basics. Then he would soup it up and make it great. And um, I, I, I'm, not the best guitarist, but I look really cool when I'm playing. You do look very cool. I, I've <laughs> witnessed it. You do look, and you sing good too, man. You sing really good. Now, you know, your top five, I know what you got going on there because I had to set everything up right now in here, but the audience uh -huh. doesn't know what you got in there. And I got to tell you something. I didn't realize on some of the top five records that you picked, you actually co-wrote some of the songs. We're going to talk about the albums that you played on too, because that's, I'm pretty, uh, I didn't know that. I'm pretty impressed with that. And it's yeah, really cool. well, I, 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 the songwriting thing, I was just, uh, uh, that's all I do is sit around the house playing guitar and uh, or on keyboard. And, uh, you know, I always from my earliest, earliest bands was was always writing. And I, I couldn't be in a band that didn't have originals. And out here, I grew up here in Louisville, Kentucky. And out here to play at the clubs, they, the clubs didn't want you to play any originals. Yeah. You know, all the whatever's uh, popular and stuff. But I was always writing even back then. And uh, um, in 1984, I joined a metal band based out of Louisville. And I ended up being kind of like the main songwriter for that band. And um, it's just something natural. And I adapted my songs to metal or yeah. super hard rock. And from then on, I just never, ever stopped. Every band I was in, I always co-wrote something. You know, that's wild. That, that's song. wild because you know you, you're you're a cat like I knew, but it, I didn't know really your story. You know, when we're playing the clubs, it's like you're still like, oh, okay, 
oh, I know, you know, I know oh, right, right, this right. guy, right. you know. Right. Now, when you when we played back in the day, Glam Nation, and you were doing you were doing your band, I think it was Crunk at the time. You guys yeah. played the Coconut Teaser on Sunset Strip too. Did you do that? Yeah, I think we played pretty much everywhere at least once, if not five times. What year was that? Uh, help me remember. What year was that? Around ninety? It was uh, well, the ninety. Uh, the end of the nineties, right? The was, first, yeah, the album came around uh, ninety eight. The uh -huh. first album, and aptly named, I called it "Greatest Hits," right off the bag, right off the, right out of the bag. And um, you know, we were just playing every club. <clears throat> excuse me, because I, I joined Scorpions uh, late '95 and started touring with them in '96. And then you know, we toured nonstop for like nine months. And then I'm okay. I'm home. Uh, and while I was on the road, I always brought a guitar with me of some sort, and was just always writing. And so Crunk started off kind of like for fun um and uh me and athena were just writing like lyric machines and uh she has some really wacky ideas and uh it just went from there and we ended up doing four albums and i'm proud very proud of them there yeah, we are yeah yeah there you guys are and i think if everybody watches athena lee you're in a bit that was a band with your wife at the time so it's right like, you know, and actually she just goes by athena like madonna she never went by athena lee and there's everybody calls her that because they figure well her brother's tommy lee and she's uh, the I'm like going, use it. You kidding? He's one of the most famous drummers in the world. And you'd be, she goes, no, and she wouldn't do no. it. She wouldn't do it, huh? Nah. She wouldn't. But the real, but the, but the name, when you go through the name, but the name, but the Lee, the, it's because his, the name is a different name, isn't it? It's not the, isn't it? A his name? No, their, their, their original name isn't Lee. It's not Lee. Yeah. No. And, you uh, know. I don't yeah. know. See, now I'm learning everything. But is this your real name, James? You don't have to. Yes, talk it really is. And and actually, uh, I played with CC for about a year and a half. CC Deville. Yeah. Um, for about a year and a half, and he goes, <clears throat> and we went to do a video. He goes, No, none of this K-O-T-T-A-K. K -O -T -T -A -K. Change it to Kodak, like the camera. Is that and, really what he said, CC? Yeah. Change it to James Kodak. K O D A K. And I should have done that years ago. It'd be been way easier than always having to go K O T T A K. And so in the video, there it is on my two bass drums, Kodak. And um, but it didn't stick. Nobody would ever call me that. Or it sounds like a you sound like you sound like a secret agent man. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean? <laughs> and and you know it, it's from an Austrian spelling from uh, G O T A G, which yeah. and when my grandparents came over to America, they changed it to K O T T A K. Here's your name. There it is. Yeah, it's funny, I, you know, because I never, we didn't really speak back then. I was a little intimidated. I'm, I'm like, oh god, the guy from the Scorpions, he's his band. That's his band. I was a little intimidated. So I don't. Nah. Now, now we get to know each other through this new world over here. So yeah. you, so when did you move to Los Angeles? I, I was just talking about it uh, the other day because I moved there in uh, late February of 1987, and I went out there to play with Rick's band, who was from Louisville. And their drummer just, they were one by one. They had moved out about a year and a half earlier. And he's like, oh, come out, our drummer's quitting. I'm like, going, well, <laughs> of course, because my band here had kind of run its course. And um, it was like, you know, we played all the big hits five nights a week and the Red Onions, you know, five sets a night, and uh, which I was used to doing anyway. And uh, so it, it was cool. That got me out here. And as soon as I got out or out there, we're here, there. And, yeah. um, you know, I immediately said, okay, my goal is to get with a band on a record label. And I immediately, you know, started going through Music Connection magazine. And sure enough, I got an audition. And then it turned out to be Kingdom Come. And they auditioned like 50-something drummers. And then they were like, oh, I'll come back for, I went back two, three more times. And that's when I first met Johnny and Danny. And I brought Rick along. And Kingdom Come, there we are. There we Watch are. Hair. Look at that hair. I, I mean, <laughs> look at the hair over there, you know. I know, well. Let me let me. I have the the logo. I'm sorry. I don't want to, nobody get mad no. at me over there. But I'm. I'll, you know what? Look at that. We'll we'll do. Uh, look at the band over there. So this this yeah. band right there. What was going? What was the scene like now? Where, well, we were really uh, what you uh, your typical LA scene type band because it was like the strip was ex had exploded and was going like I mean I mean you go down on on any night of the week and there's you know. 100 plus people out handing out flowers on the sidewalk. You couldn't even get into most of the clubs. There's bands running seven nights a week, uh, you know, four or five bands a night. And King of Come never did that. We, we, uh, you know, the it was signed to Polygram Records. And we 
we're, we're in a rehearsal studio. We'd go out and, and goof off and stuff. But yeah. Lenny was insisting. He goes, no way. We're never going to play that Sunset Strip thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, but shouldn't we go play somewhere? And we didn't. We, we went and made an album in August in, of 87 in Vancouver. And uh, I was up there for several weeks. It was phenomenal. And we did it with Bob Rock. It was legendary. First, legendary. I know. And it was his first uh, kind of album outside of his world from Canada, uh, first international band. And uh, man, dude, I learned so much. And he was phenomenal. And uh, that first album, I'm super mega proud. The second one's great, too. And that was with Keith Olsen. But um, who, you know, who we did, did, that. Who did Keith Olsen, we talked about earlier. He did yeah. Springfield, Fleetwood Mac, amazing producer. Uh, White Stag, I mean, God. The, it's did he do Charlie yeah. Sexton? Am I? Oh no, the Keith. That's Keith. Forrest. I think he did, because that name was always popping up. He did. Yeah. I mean, countless. Uh, he did. Uh, I mean, Jesse's girl. and this one and that one, and you know, God rest his soul, man. He was he was treated me so well. He hired me probably for at least twelve different albums. Because number one, I'm a pretty good drummer. Number two, I live not even a mile from his studio, and I was always hanging around there anyway. I mean, getting to work with him. Oh. With that producer, because one of my best favorite drum sounds. Did he, did he do Rumors? Did he do the Fleetwood Mac Rumors record? Yeah, I think he mixed it. I don't know if he, he did the, the, the whole thing, because they went through a few guys on that one. And he kind of got the reputation of saving an album with major artists. And he did. He uh, That White Snake album was uh, the one with Still oh, yeah. the Night. Yeah, I forgot about that. The biggest album ever. And, and uh, he rescued that album. It was like a disaster, because there was like, Every track had like 40 guitar tracks and all this crazy stuff, and he fixed it. Wow. wow. Now, now, when you went to Canada, was that the studio with Loverboy? They were like one of the first. Bands. Yeah, Love, uh, it was Little Mountain Studios, and That's that was right. Loverboy. Aerosmith did all their albums, Bon Jovi. Um, it was just ACDC. Everybody recorded a Little Mountain who was anybody. And that's why when we went there, I didn't know anything about it. And we got there, and I'm looking like, wow. You know, and while we were recording in one studio, Steven Tyler was there working on songs for the Aerosmith album, which was good. which became their big, huge comeback. And uh, he was he was a riot man uh, to hang wow. out with. And he wasn't drinking or he was sober at the time. And uh, yeah, we kind of followed his lead and stuff. And this is a, I, I can't even describe it, how uh, amazing it was. I mean, we we're talking earlier. You got to write a book. A lot of great stories. You know what? I had Mike Reno on the show from Loverboy, and they oh, yeah. were one of the first bands that, that used the studio. Then they go, we couldn't even get time to get back in there. Yeah, because it, it was it had something, man, and and uh, it was that was a really great experience. It kind of turned out to be like the Abbey Road of that generation studio, where everybody wanted to go. I've got, to. I mean, so many albums. I got a little cold chill just thinking about it. So many albums were done in that studio, and we were one of them. And um, I'm not comparing us to Aerosmith and Bon Jovi, but hey, man, uh, they they all recorded there, so hopefully no. it must have rubbed off on us. No, big, big, huge records. I mean, yeah. huge anthem sounding records that took over the airwaves yeah. for that era in music. And it was a fun time to be a musician and to be a fan of music. Yeah, then. you were playing all over the place, right? Right, in, well, all over the, all over LA, and who knows where you played? You probably went around the world about 50 times too, and. Uh, Man, it was just a, just a really wonderful time. It really was a, a great time in music. Mm -hmm. And it was a good community back then, you know? Yeah. You know, the club scene. Like, so I tried to Sunset Strip. See, I moved to L.A. Uh, right when it was ending. But I remember visiting. It was like a party. It was like New Orleans or something. You couldn't walk the streets on it, Sunset it, Strip. It really was. And every Tuesday <laughs> night, go to the cat house. Every Thursday night, you go to um, whatever it was called and – you know, and every, I mean, I was going out Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday back then because it was fun. And then we went on, uh, Keenan Palmer in early 88, we went on a world tour that just never ended. And um, so I really miss being there a lot, man. And um, it was a great thing. So how did you, so you didn't do the club, Kingdom, didn't, they didn't do we never did the, Our first show was like in England somewhere. We did like uh, three weeks in England and then another five, five weeks across Europe. And we played everywhere, man. And it was it was awesome. We were opening for a band called Magnum. And they were kind of a huge English band at the time. Yeah. yeah and uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, uh, our, I remember our, talking to our manager on a, we were on a group phone. We were all sitting around the phone talking. He goes, he goes, you guys know that, uh, you know, the album's exploding over here. And we're like, going, oh, yeah, sure, right, whatever. And, you know, because 
no computers, no phones. No, yeah. hardly ever. We were incommunicado most of the time. Sure enough, we get off the plane in May and, and we got we come out getting picked up at the airport. Here's our here's uh, our manager, his wife, uh, the assistant and secretary standing on the curb in front of cars holding up gold albums. We're like going, wow, it really, it really did. It was big. It was gold before he even played a, uh, a gig in America, which is that's crazy. Yeah, at the time we were the number one most shipped album um, of any al debut album ever, and that held up for a long, long time, till I think a couple of years ago. What label were you guys on? Polygram. Polygram. Or wow. if you watch the Spinal Tap, it's Palomir. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's funny, man. That's I know. that's crazy. So it was like the more just people on the streets, the magazines. Kerrang, all those people pushing it radio, out. Radio, radio took it. There was a station in Detroit. Radio started playing "Get It On," and they wouldn't say who the band name was, which is okay with us because they were hinting around that it might be Led Zeppelin. Which is, I'll take it. Our singer was like mortified, and he made it a habit of telling everybody all the Zeppelin comparison. That's na da 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 da. I'm like going, dummy. Like if somebody asked me, said, "Man, you know, did you ever listen to John Bonham?" I go, "Are you kidding? I grew up playing to the to the eight track of Led Zeppelin four. Anything I could get my hands on Zeppelin, I saw him laugh. I stood in line and bought tickets for eight dollars and fifty cents to see Zeppelin, and it was just like, you know." And he hated that that we we had ever even mentioned that comparison. But I was like, well, "Are you kidding? If you're going to be compared to somebody, be compared to the to the best." Yeah, which are the yeah. singers that Lenny Wolf we're talking about for everybody. Yeah, I mean, he meant well. He, uh, you know, he had been in America for a few years and had a band and was on a major record label. And, and but his um, uh, his interpretation was way different from anybody else's interpretation of how you should go about doing interviews and doing this and that. But he's a great singer. We're still friends to this day. Yeah. Wow. So what's he, what's Lenny do these days now? Lenny okay. is, uh, well, he lives in Hamburg, Germany uh -huh. and uh, he loves staying home. I just started talking to him back in 2010 about revamping kingdom come. Anytime we play in Hamburg he'd come to see scorpions and uh, I'd see him here and there uh, around Europe very rarely. And then he ended up, uh, we did a Russia tour. Uh, scorpions paved the way for everybody to go to Russia. And one of our tours we did, it was uh, Kingdom Come opened, Alice Cooper and Scorpions. Great bill, wow. whatever. And so me and Lenny hung out a whole lot then. And um, that was that, I think that was 2010 when we really started talking. And I kept going, man, we got, you know, let's do an album. Because at the time, Scorpions announced, it's the end of the time. We're going to retire. We're going to go away. This is the last album, the last tour. Of course, it wasn't. I had Kingdom Come up and running at my band. I was trying to work it. And uh, I, a couple other projects, one with Carrie Kelly, we had uh, a thing going on, which became Project Rock and now The New Revenge, and it's had five different names. But um, it just, you know, time went on. And But then the phone rings one day, and it's uh, Klaus going, hey, James, you know, uh, we've decided not to retire. We're going to do another album. I'm like going, oh. I mean, I was excited on one hand. On the other, I know that meant record an album and then go tour for the next three years. So there was no, and they also said, hey, do you mind not playing with all these other projects you go out, going on? I'm like, going, oh, so here I was. I had to like pull the plug on almost everything, you know, because I had an allegiance towards them and, yeah. you know, they might have kicked up my pay a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But I hated that. And then it's when we, we did part ways finally around 2017, I immediately, uh, I kind of knew it was coming and it had already put the years in motion, but I took like a year and a half off and did basically, I stayed home. I was burnt out on traveling and, and, um, <clears throat> but here we are, we got the kingdom come back up and running and we went out and played and, you know, a lot of bumps in the road with that. Well, yeah, yeah. You guys will, well, the kingdom come story, you know, you got the big hit, you guys had the Zeppelin sound. So the radio station is playing, you guys not saying the name of the band, trying yeah. more people in thinking it's Zeppelin. Is that what they were trying to do? <clears throat> oh, oh yeah. Cause radio will do anything to get, get, get ratings and get whatever the, and it was really cool. But uh, finally the cat was out of the bag and all oh, that's not Zeppelin, but it didn't hurt by then. We were really up and running. And our first tour was uh, the monsters of rock tour in the summer of 88. And that was with uh, Kingdom Come opening Metallica, Dokken, 
Scorpions, Van Halen, in that order. That's how wow. the park was blowing up and it right in front of our eyes. It was it was so incredible. Wow, just that whole that you just name like l- listen to that lineup right there. Dawkins, Scorpions, Metallica. Well, in the order of appearance, yeah. yeah. Kingdom Come, uh Kingdom Come Metallica was second, Dawkins was third, Scorpions fourth, and I, it's like wow. And to be a part of that, that history oh, my God. right there, you we know, so you constantly. And uh, incredible. So, and then we did a, uh, after that, we did an indoor arena tour with uh, Scorpions. And that's how I've really got to know the guys. Um, and uh, who knew? Who did, who did you bond with in Scorpions when, from that tour? Who was the guy that you were like, you know, oh, yeah, come Most on. Mostly Rudolph. And Rudolph. yeah, he's, he's a great guy. He's a funny guy. And, and he and I, you know, and then, you know, on nights off, because we only played like on that Monsters of Rock tour, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. And um, so there was a lot of time to hang out and everybody like, well, hey, you guys want to go out? And, of course. What do we do? Where do we go? Or we go out after the gig. And, yeah. um, you know, it was a lot of downtime. But, man, I wouldn't trade it for nothing. Scorpions was so big, too. I remember and and so, hit after hit after hit. It was so. And, and, and getting down the road to be in the band with them. Oh, and dude. not only that, I don't want to give the, the secrets away what we're going to, You got to write with Klaus. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's man. so cool. I mean, did you pinch yourself thinking, I can't believe it. Like, I was a fan of this band. Now I'm, like, over there writing. I did. I, and and um, yeah, I, I did the first album in, in 2008. I, I co-wrote on a couple things because I was actually singing on a lot of stuff, too. But singing background, I'm like, oh, I'm singing on, with Klaus, you know, on an album. And, uh, and uh, I, I co-wrote on a couple songs. That wasn't so such a big deal. And but then later we did the album Unbreakable. Yeah. And I I wrote completely three songs. And I was like going, Klaus is singing my song. And we played it live. I was like going, unbelievable. Who knew? It is unbelievable. Louisville, Kentucky. And <laughs> I was I was, you know, I loved every second of it, man. Yeah, man. You great stuff, you know, man. Great stuff. Great yeah. stuff. You gotta be proud of all this stuff you you did, you know. I'm mega proud and and I'm um, what was really great is those guys are really, really good guys. You know, it's not like I joined a band. I'm like, going, oh, I can't stand this one. Or these guys are scumbag. They're all just really good guys, man. You That's know, and, cool. uh, it did have its ups and downs. And because, you know, in the late 90s, rock wasn't really huge no. as, as as we know it. And, uh, you know, we put that out of our record out. And it, it yeah, I mean, it had a lot of loops and a lot of things that, that most people didn't really care for it that much, but the songs were great. And uh, yeah, man. it's it's a rock and out. It's funny when you say late nineties, and I think maybe that might have been around the time that you and I bumped into each other. But the club, the club, it was like the end of the scene. L.A. wasn't what it was when you and I. No, were and when, clubs, yeah, it, once it was yeah, well, I, once and I hate, hate to say it, but when you know, once grunge came along, L.A. became a ghost town, and yeah. uh, and if you followed trying to be grunge nobody's gonna buy it because they know oh, you're not grunge you're you're some band who used to be glam in la you to love the pants what do you mean you got baggy <laughs> pants and a flannel shirt what happened to yeah, you are you wearing shorts <laughs> I, I had tons of friends go that route and they got their combat boots and army shorts and it which was good for you but whatever but it never works it never worked you know what the thing is the, the music was good everybody played well i just always the rock star. Everybody looked like a roadie. There was no more like, where's the stars? I anymore? know, and and I like all that stuff. Like Trust I said, I played with CC, and man, he was like, we got, you know, I love it. It's we like, rock and roll. It's the pageantry. It's the majestic this, and then he had a way of putting it to where like, you're like, when you wanted it to be that way, and uh, you know, it just the the whole uh, glam thing fizzled out. Which I never was glam. I was always a hard rock guy, and uh, yeah. you know, hard rock man, and. Uh, but hey, man, to each his own, and there's room for everybody here. To, to each, so, wait, so wait, what band did you play with CC Deville? Now, what did you? Um, it, it was, uh, it was actually called Needle Park. It was me, uh, CC. Uh, uh, God dang it! What's the singer for Foreigner? Um, uh, Kelly was it? Kelly, yeah, Kelly Hansen was the singer. Really, Kelly and Hansen? Kelly Hendrickson, who's the bass player, or Tom, he plays yeah. guitar with Alice. And Tom Hendrickson, is that when he had the band P.O.D. or before P.O.D.? I, I'm not, it was around about the same time. And uh, wow. man, we had some great songs and we were signed to, uh, well, CC was signed through uh, 
what was the Disney Hollywood Records. Okay. And uh, yeah. I knew them because uh, I also played uh, with World War Three, and. Funny enough, World War III was the heaviest heavy metal band. I've, I love those guys. And they were the first band ever signed to the Disney label. Go figure. And uh, so it was all around that time period. And uh, But uh, I always loved that about CC. He was yeah, Tara's over, over here. Wasn't Tommy and Needle Park? Yeah, that's what we're talking about now. Yeah, Needle uh, Park. Needle Park was the band with James. And it was Tommy. It was Kelly, who sings Kelly Hansen. Who, yeah. Uh, am I right? Uh, who sings with Foreigner now. Right. And wait, who am I missing? Cece? Cece. Cece DeVille. So Tommy was playing bass. Um, yeah, Tommy's playing bass and because he plays guitar with Alice Cooper, I think. I used to yeah. see Tommy play in New York. He's from Long Island. And he had a band with his brother, Eugene. And they do, this is 1983 at Lamar's yeah. in Brooklyn. They do half Motley Crue and half Van Halen. His brother, Eugene, was the drummer. Then he'd come out and he he would do David Lee Roth better than David Lee Roth. Like, it was like, you know what? I met all of Tommy's brothers at one point or another. Out, I'd expect the call, and Tommy would go like, "Yo, Kotak, you know, uh, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm gonna ask? I know I'll put it, your brother is on the list, and blah blah blah." And they all come out, and yeah, I'll put it. But you know, fam, they're like family. It was, it was hilarious, man. Tommy's a good are, guy. He's a really yeah, good he's guy. Great, man. He, he's, he was really he's good. He was doing that yeah. Hollywood vampires. Thing up, and I think they just put an album out. They're doing again, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're doing another one. Tommy would sneeze and get a record deal. He's one of those <laughs> yeah. he, he was, I mean, he always, he'd always, I go, What do you work? He did, uh, he did two of the Kotak albums. Well, Crunk game Kotak because, uh, at the time, uh, Athena came up, come up with the name. I go, That's great because we would use the word crunk instead yeah. of four word expletives around the kids. Oh, crunk, crunk you, crunk off. Crunk this, crunk that. Then all of a sudden, here comes rappers are saying crunk every other time. So I don't know if she overheard it, but their crunk was C R U N K. So we did that. And oh, is that yeah. where you got the name? So that's how you got the name crunk. Yeah, that's funny. I to avoid that. cussing around the kids. <laughs> that's pretty pretty funny. That's a tough one to do, huh? <laughs> oh well, I don't cuss. Really cuss. Believe it or no. not, it sounds crazy. I don't. I just never was a. F this and F that kind of a guy or GD. F, see, I saw Cyanide Fever and it went down the toilet. Then I couldn't even stop. You know, that's oh, yeah. Like, that's right. <laughs> Cyanide Fever yeah, was, a, was the word in that movie. Now, if you were going to do that movie, it's when you really watch Sinai Fever, it's, it's, you can't, there's things you can't even talk about nowadays. It's like, it's of heavy. Course. It's a whole different world we live in. Even songwriting, the things that you used to talk about back then, I don't even think you could record now the lyrics. Kiss. Christine, sixteen, come on! <laughs> yeah, right, no. think of, think uh, about it. You know, Ringo Starr had. Uh, she was only sixteen, or no, uh, not Ringo Starr. Um, no, no uh, had, uh, you're Ringo Starr. Um, yeah, you're, 16. you're sixteen. You're beautiful, and you're mine. Do you know what's funny about that? That you said that, James. I'm yes. going to be doing a radio show, and I was talking to the owner, and he's like, "Hey, there's certain songs that we can't do." It's like you do, you wouldn't believe. And then one of the guys was telling me who was a big DJ back from uh, New York on NBC. I think, it, uh, I think, yeah, he was on NBC. Um, big J and big J Sorensen. He's like, you wouldn't believe it, but you're 16. You came to some station. You can't even play it now. I'm like, I believe what? it. I mean, everybody's so freaked out and uptight about uh, this political uh, correctness and being woke and all that stuff. It's like, you know, I hate to say it. It's like, just, talk you can't you can't, you can't you can't say that word you Why? can't it's a word it's like it's not gonna kill you you know picture if lenny bruce was here now oh my <laughs> God. He would, like, he'd be banned everywhere be, totally it totally be it totally be banned but man what what a great story we're going to talk about you know your life james any questions you got here we'll talk about what you're doing what you're not doing and whoever you want to talk about what you don't want you complete the fifth but the main thing is, it's like, how do you get to know people and bond with people? It's about when you're a kid in school, it's like, who's your favorite sports or, or who, who, right. who's in your record collection? So in the audience, you guys want to know, we're going to ask some questions here, but it's time for his top five. It's This is what the people are asking. It's what they're yelling about. And James, it is Thank time you. for you to address your must-have top five albums. Are you ready, sir? I am totally ready. I've been right. practicing all day. Are you... 
<laughs> All right. Well, we got number five. And number five, I've got it lined up in here for you. And number five, I'll let you name the band. And I'll, I can only play four seconds of the songs, everybody, because of YouTube. So I'll be counting on my fingers. So, James, what's number five? The Ramones, of course. And it's uh, I, I always get the title wrong. That's um, it right there. That's the course. album. Yeah, all, all the stuff in more of my music. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great album. I put it on. I used to put it on before to, just to get fired up to, before a show and stuff. And uh, I don't. I've never had Volume One. I probably. I think I used to have it on CD, whatever those are now. And uh, but the, it's just an all around great album. If you've never checked out Ramones, get this album and just put it on and don't take it off. Ramones. Well, the album on this album right here, because I did my homework for you right here. I have Rockaway Beach was one of my favorite songs, which yeah. Dee Dee Ramone wrote. So cool, man. It's so cool. It's so tight. And the way Tommy Ramone plays that song, the original drummer, if you watch the way he's playing, it's it's wild. His, I, it's so foreign to me to watch him. I mean, I, how it's, he does it's this. hard. No, no ride symbol ever. No, <laughs> you know, no, it's it's, it's wild. Totally. And, and wow, speaking of Ramones, you played with one, Dee Dee Ramone. With Dee Dee Ramone, yeah, yeah, that was my 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 time and my moment. Over, and I was playing with him when I met you when we we're doing the Glam Nation stuff. I was playing with Dee Dee in between that. Matter was of it, fact, you know what, yeah. James? He yeah. came to the show that you you played with us. Oh he, wow. Yeah, he came to that show to watch me. Why didn't you introduce and, me? <laughs> and and he got mad at me because you can't be playing with anybody anymore. You gotta just now play with me. It was <laughs> you know, but right. yeah, he, 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 he was there. But that album, this album right here for everybody watching, it, you got 30 songs on here, and I got it. Cream Hop, Rockway Be Beach, Here Today, Gone Tomorrow. You got you got I Don't Care, which was a great yeah. song, which Joey Ramone. Uh, Ropa Didi always loved doing that one. Sheena is a punk rocker, another Joey Ramone song, which we'd always yeah. do. Um, Teenage Lobotomy. You had a cover <laughs> of Do You Want to Dance? Right? Uh, oh, 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 I don't want to put this on yet. Wait, hold on. I almost messed up. You know, you had a cover of Do You Want to Dance? And um, it was just great stuff, man. Great yeah, stuff. I mean, I just killed I, and I was really thrilled. Uh, I, I was fortunate to meet him at the Limelight in New York. Um, and honestly, <laughs> there was two of them. <laughs> I met two Ramones, and it, it escapes me what, who, who it was, uh, which Ramon it was. But I was like, going, yes, because it, it was up in the office. And then I saw them play. Uh, they didn't play that night. They were just hanging. And then I saw them play down in Florida, mm. and uh, they were just great. And great. I, was, I, I think that's when I really went, oh, my God, Ramones. And that was like early 90s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they really, um, it was funny because when Dee Dee, a little history here, we'll go back and forth and do. Yeah. Hit, I'll ask you some questions. When I asked him about like the whole Ramones, he took it from Paul McCartney, the name, because Paul McCartney went under a, a, a different name, Ramon, when they were first starting the Beatles. I and, did not know that. Yeah, and that's where they got the name, the Ramones. Everybody would say, oh, are they are they brothers? No. No, they oh, weren't. Of course not. I, yeah, that's what I say. I that's what I said. I met two of them. It was uh, one with definitely Joey, and uh, um, one of the other ones. And, it, and it, I, I didn't know really know who I was meeting. Tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. And then as well, um, they were. He was trying to learn, and this is a true story. Accidentally, how he wrote the major hit song, Blitzkrieg Bob, he was trying to learn Saturday night from the Bay City Rollers and he was couldn't, he was toned up, so he couldn't figure it out the chords and he right. was getting frustrated and then he went, hey, ho, let's go. He's like getting so frustrated. So if you listen to- Oh my God. So it comes, oh, Jesus. Yeah, if you listen to that, you know, and then you A, B it next to the other, then you go, ah, it makes sense now. Uh, S-A-T-U-I. Hey, ho, let's go. Like, I, you know. Okay. He was, he was getting that frustrated. Was so I actually saw the Bay City Rollers in LA at Club Lingerie, and uh, me and CC went. We, we couldn't miss it, and uh, they were great, yeah. man. Oh, love them, love the yeah. Bay City Rollers. Grew up with them, you know. I know. Just... And when you were a kid, if, or when they came out, and if you liked it, everybody'd call you. You'd be queer. <laughs> <laughs> they were cool. They, oh, and, and, I know. It was like Beatlemania all over again for them. It was yeah, like, it was. 
it was Bay City Roller Mania, but that, that's a great record, and that's volume two that you picked on the Ramones, and the first one is, is just as good, too, but there's so many good songs. You got I Want to Be Sedated. You got Needles and Pins on that, which is written by Sonny Bono. Get out. Yep, Sonny Bono. You'll see. No, really, get out. <laughs> get, let me tell you something. Hang out with me. You won't. I can't count, but I could tell you some music facts that I kind of I, know. I, dude, I, I'm going to listen all day. I, I'll keep you on here for, for two days, man, talking rock and roll. Oh, it's so, great to talk rock and roll. Okay. Let's like, like the Ramon thing. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, it's very cool. Because you guys, you know, the band that you did with Athena, it was, you had a punky edge to you guys. It, it was, uh, I like to describe it as Cheap Trick meets Green Day on a bad day. Yeah. And because I really, I went through a Green Day phase. Uh, when their album uh, Dookie exploded, I never heard of Green Day. But all of a sudden, I was like, oh, these songs are great. I got the album, and I really, really listened to it. And that's when I was really starting to really go, I got to learn how to play guitar good. And um, that's where a lot of the influence came from. Plus, I always loved Cheap Trick, man. Oh, how, how could you not? Right here, you know this guy is? Right here, Mitch Weissman, how you doing? Mitch Weissman right there is mm -hmm. the original Paul McCartney from Beatlemania on Broadway. Oh, wow. Yeah, Mitch Weiss. Congratulations, Mitch. Yeah, and Mitch also worked with Kiss on some of their records over there, wrote songs with them, played on Gene Simmons' solo record, the first, that first wow. one. Wow. But Mitch Weiss, I guess the story is, I don't, I don't want to put words in Mitch's mouth, Gene couldn't get Paul and, and John, so he got the guys from Beatlemania who played <laughs> one in the ball. And Mitch that's, so, that's so Gene Simmons. Uh, <laughs> that's so funny. But Mitch is a great guy, great musician, and he played Lefty for a short time to do the McCartney. I don't, you remember the Broadway show? Like, oh, yeah, years? yeah. He Speaking was the Broadway first. shows. Yeah, um, he, I, I saw the Green Day, uh, uh, I saw the Green Day play in New York City. That oh, oh. Oh, real? <laughs> I forgot the name of it. Um, anyway, all the actors all came out and were hanging out, and I got them to sign my poster, and I got it somewhere. Oh, that's <laughs> it cool. It was great, because it was all Green Day music, and they had a band on stage and stuff. It was great. That, that's cool. We have my buddy Eric Bagrack. I have every B City Rollers on vinyl. All wow. Now, 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 Eric, he was very kind to me. He sent me, I'm a huge Beatle fan, he sent me this Japanese version of John Lennon's rock and roll record, which... Oh, I put it away right there, but it's it's so cool. It's the it's a cover of John Lennon on his Lost Weekend when he did like Peggy Sue. He's doing all the covers from the fifties, right. and the story. There's a whole story about that. We'll talk. I could tell you later about it, but it's mm -hmm. it's it's a great record. And thank you very much, Eric, for that. But okay, let's go to number four. The number four count that you're going to pick on this one is drum roll. Yes. Warren Ophophobic. <laughs> I Come love yeah, that album is is great A to Z, but beginning to end. And Janie, I always thought Janie was the most one of the most talented guys I've ever met in my life. And uh, what was really really uh great for me, I I would he for some reason he had a thing, he goes, Oh, drummers can't write, you know, and he was originally a drummer. In Florida, I remember he had a band called Plain Jane way back when, and I saw him play. He was great, and he still he still was good, you know, all, all through. R.I.P. Janie, I really miss him. And, yeah, now uh, you, you know, the, the, to be clear, everybody watching, you were playing drums on this. You you were in Warrant on this record. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> it started off. We were just gonna me and uh, we were gonna fill in. And I'm like going, man, you need another guitarist. Let's get Rick Steyer, and here comes Rick again. And uh, because Rick's just he's just an all around great guitarist, and man, it, it felt really good. And then Jay's like, Oh, well, we want to make a record, and I'm like, going, Okay, cool. So I, I would show a riff to to Rick, and then Rick would show it to Janie because he had something in his head about uh, drummers can't write, <laughs> or so I don't, it was kind of like he was being facetious. Um, and so I, I the riff, the whole family picnic song is um. I wrote basically, oh, and then Rick wrote the, the riff on the verse. And um, so Janie never knew until after the album came out, we told him. <laughs> and I wrote, wrote a couple other ones. I love you wrote, that album. Right, here's one you wrote, I believe. Check it out. Right? Did you? I'm going a blank. I don't think so. Live inside of is you didn't. Oh, out? live inside of you. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, I have to recheck that one. 
I know for sure Family Picnic, and there was two others. And that might be one, but I know Rick wrote that riff. Really? Okay. Yeah. I want to make sure that I'm not wrong here. So hold on. Let me look at some of the selections on that. Yeah. I want to make sure that, but the record is, I'll tell you one thing about the record. It's a different Warren sound. It's a whole oh, other totally. sound. And this is, a, that's an example of a band trying to find their uh, new way, not being grunge, but we're just finding a new way. Yeah. And thank God the guys at the record label, the guy at the record label, the main dude, he was like going, man, just, write whatever you're writing don't try to be grunge because grunge had taken over and um that's where this came album came from and i'm super proud of it it's we a great on record it, crazy it's different it's a different record but listen to yeah. it it's cool it's cool it's man like it's, it's not but that's the song it's yeah cool. it was great man you know? and, again janie was one of the best songwriters most talented musician i've ever i've ever known man he he just had he just had it whatever it is he did have it man you know what it's crazy it's one of those guys you know for, unfortunately and i'll admit to it i didn't appreciate it once later he was gone he used to come to the cat club jam with us he always wanted to do cheap trick surrender of but course after yeah, now he, lo he loved it but when i went to see rock of ages and when i heard they played warrant in there i'm like oh yeah what a great it's like it's such an amazing song. Maybe because when you're close in the same scene with people, you don't want to give the credit to anybody. But it yeah, was it was a, it was a di different vibe then, and a lot of people wouldn't acknowledge this one or that one. And um, you know, but I, I always did. And, uh, you know, I saw Red. I mean, you really oh my did. god, what an incredible song! He could just turn out a he could turn out a ballad a day. He had so many ones that were never released. Never and, released, uh, huh? We got to know each other because Kingdom Come and Warrant, uh, we toured together on a, on on our second album, and it was their, I think their second album, and man, they I tell you what, we swapped places each night because it was co-headlining, and honestly, when they went on first, they kicked our butt, man, because they were so exciting and so you know, Janie was so he could just take it, you know, he could take an audience full of rocks and get them all jumping up and down and doing everything. He was great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was great. Great, great songwriter. So then oh, you did. How long? Now, how long did you play? Tell me your Warren story. How did you get in, in involved I, with these was, guys? You know, I'm not really sure. I just remember getting a call or something said, uh, you know, would you come over and, 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 you know, at least meet Janie and he lived close to Rick. So I went over there and I, that's when I discovered they only had uh, the one guitar. They had Eric and Jerry and Janie and then. And then I became the drummer, and then we needed another guitarist, and that's when Rick came in. And um, yeah, I don't know what just happened now, now that you mention it. Oh, you... oh, the girl, <laughs> the secretary, Keith Olson's office called me. She goes, "Oh, Warren needs a drummer. Nobody knows, so don't tell anybody. But you know, if you want to go meet meet up with you, I'm like, going, are you kidding? And uh, there we go. That's crazy. So this this record right here was it produced by Bo Hill? Did he produce? Yeah. Record? Oh yeah. That's the other connection. Bo is great, man. He's real subtle with the way he operates, but he, uh, you know, he did Rat, the Round and Round record. He did all kinds of stuff, and he just he brought that album to life, man. It was yeah, great. He did. He did. I just saw a comment in here about Family Picnic. Uh, who 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 wrote that? Oh, Zandra. Zandra. She she. I like Family. Picnic. Yeah. I, 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 well, I wrote the the riff. Uh, Dun, 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 da, da, dun, dun, dun. And then Rick wrote the verse riff. And then um, Janie always had Janie always had an idea of a song before there was ever even any music. He goes, Yeah, man, I got one of the song where the verse is gonna go like, oh no, almost like a like a boys choir singing. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And yeah. there it was. Wow, wow, pretty good. Now working with Bo Hill. What a oh, le great. another legend, huh? Yeah, man, and uh, he was a uh, he just a, a great producer. The goal is his goal should be to bring out the best of the band or the individual he's working with, and he mm. certainly did. They just have the the uh, great producers like that just have a way of explaining it to where James understands. I get it, you know. Yeah. You have to really dumb it down to make a point sometimes, and I'm like, oh, oh why don't you just tell me you play it like that? because <laughs> sometimes it's that easy to make a, a average song great yeah you know family picnic uh, i mean the message up there against family violence i mean it was a heavy song uh, yeah. when you, we did when a video you listen 
you did a video for that too. It was a heavy yeah. song. So the, it, it, I guess from the, the notes that I have here, it says it was inspired from his divorce from Bobby Brown, the album. That's where his head was at writing that record. Now, is that I, true or? I, I, I'm not really sure about that, but um, uh, I forgot who, I'm not, I don't think it was his daughter that played the part of the little girl in the, in the video. Um, I don't really recall that yeah. about anything to do with Bobby Brown. Yeah. This was, it was about a, a, and family violence kind of a thing. And whoever was the big promoter of that, uh, they sent us banners we hung up everywhere we played or something. Yeah, because I, I, I was curious about that, you know, when they yeah. were saying, because the record's pretty heavy and it's pretty deep, you know. They, yeah. You know, Janie's um, songwriting, he, well, now, but they didn't get a lot of credit. And as guys, as players mm -hmm. right now, they still rocked. I just saw them on the Kiss Cruise, and my buddy Robbie Crane was filling in for Jerry on bass, another great bass player. Oh, yeah, yeah. I knew Jerry was, uh, I knew Robbie was filling in. I didn't know, is Jerry, Jerry's okay, though, yeah. yeah he's okay because he, he does a couple of shows that he wants to do, and then I guess, you know, they, they switch off whatever, you know, oh, I, I think, yeah, I don't know if Jerry's yeah. running the show. I don't know the whole situation. So yeah. I, don't, I, yeah. So anybody yeah. out there watching, I please, I don't know what I'm talking about, but if yeah, you do yeah, know, know, put your anything. comments down below. Okay. We've got to be <laughs> careful what you say over here. And, uh, you know, even my, my knowledge about, was it inspired by Janie's divorce with Bobby Brown? I don't know. I don't know Bobby. I just know cherry pie and that's it. That's it. I just know her from the video and the album <laughs> cover, but God bless everybody everyone okay. you know okay so let's go into number three do we leave any other good facts out about that um man because uh, uh, that's it because so that record that record you went because that's the record that you replaced steven sweet but you don't know what happened with him or why he left or what he, uh, I, 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 i'm not really sure what went on with that but uh you know some people said he quit some people said he was sick some people that you never really get the whole story. And I, quite honestly, it's none of my business. I, I was yeah. just scared to death to work with Janie. And like I said, we toured together. So we kind of all knew each other pretty good. And yeah. that that's a big, you know, a huge part of being in a band is, you know, you can get along with everybody in the band. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. that's very cool. The very Yeah, cool. so I already knew. I, I, I like Janie and Jerry and Eric very much so. And, uh, and then here yeah. comes Rick. And, yeah. Very cool, man. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So now we got number three. Legendary okay. album. Big album. Look. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You ready? I'm ready. Back in black. Yes, sir. <laughs> 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 I mean, <laughs> there you go. All right. So there it is. So back you in know, black. <laughs> how can you not have ACDC back in black in your top five? I don't care who you are, man. Even if you don't like ACDC, what an incredible album! I remember what it, it coming out. It was just on the radio twenty four seven. It was just so nonstop. And uh, I eventually, I ACDC, uh, Rick says, "What's the because uh, on my Twitter and whatever they're always saying, what concert have you seen? What band have you seen the most? It's ACDC. They we were in uh, on our first Kingdom Come London tour, and we had like about a week off for some reason." And ACDC was playing, and they sold out the, the Wembley uh, Arena. They were there four nights, and we went three nights out of the four. And uh, then I've seen them in L.A. many times. Wow. Just wow. great. The songs are great. And uh, I, I remember once in uh, it, we were in uh, Berlin, and here I come walking down the hall. Here comes Brian Johnson uh, walking down the hall. He's like, going, hey, James. I'm like, oh, I'm surprised he remember my name because we were staying at the same hotel, and here they are. And I go, hey, what's going on, Brian? And it's like, wow, you remember my name. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I've run into those guys here and there, you know, over the years. And it's it's always thrilling. And one thing about ACDC, they don't have back. There is no backstage. If you no, go to really? ACDC, really? You know, yeah, because I remember we went to see him down in Anaheim at the whatever arena. And in this section, you know, like say our section had 50, 60 seats. In it, everybody was in a band. If there's Jeff Pilson, there's this one, there's that one, uh, Don Dock, and you name it. It was like a who's who of rock and roll. Alanis Morissette was there. I mean, and that was like really, really cool because nobody could go backstage. So we all were out in the audience like regular people, which was wow. great. <laughs> wow, that that's wild. And this record was a big record. It was the, it was the sixth studio album for-, for I know, for they put that one out almost every year. That yeah. was what you did back then. Um, and uh, I, 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 wow. 
Because 1979, Highway to Hell came out right before this, and it was following the death of Bon Scott, which I think there's demos of Bon Scott and Eric Backrack are probably, he'll, he'll go in the chat and tell me. I think there's demos of him even singing some of the songs. If I'm mistaken, I'm not sure if he even co-wrote, so I'm not sure. But if you do know, put it in the comments. Put You know, fix the knowledge here, everybody. Yeah, I, I, know the, I know the answer to that, but I'm- Do you? I'm, Disclosure. Yeah, it, you're not it, supposed it, to disclose it. Oh, come on, no, man! No, no, no. <laughs> it, it really was. Most of those songs had he had recorded. Uh, bon Scott had recorded. He did, and, he... and I, 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 a, a lot of the, the vocal performance you're hearing from Brian Johnson was patterned exactly after um, uh, Bon Scott. Wow, so he lived on in infamy, so to speak. And man, what wow. a loss! It's crazy how they kind of have the same sound. What was the name of uh, uh, Johnson's band before? Was it Jordy? J what was the name? Something like that. Jordy or J J uh, something I mean, like that. I can't think of it. I know, I know it, but I, I can't. There was, there was a band, but, but he had the same kind of tone and sound like like him. Yeah, you know? and the cadence. He really you know, did. The, the, just how he sings it and the order. And, and, and um, you know, there's Angus, like, you know, ran the show, of course. Yeah. Oh, it was great. I remember seeing, well, my first show of ACDC was Flick of the Switch. I saw, I went to see that at the Meadowlands in New York. That I do remember. Wow. Um, not, mine was fly on the wall. That fly really, the, really? Fly yeah, on the wall, huh? And it's just. Oh, yeah. See, Zandra. Yep. Yeah, that's it. She she knew. Thank you. Thank you for that. She knew that was Brian Johnson's oh, band. Jordy? Jordy. Gordy or Jordy? I think I knew my glasses. Yeah. Um, I, you know what? I'll go with you because I'm from Brooklyn. I'll say everything wrong. So you know what? However <laughs> you pronounce it, it is. And if the fans don't like it, you'll you'll hear from them. Don't worry about it. Um, sure. <laughs> but no, it was cool. It was cool. Now, when Axel came in, Axel Rose came in to, to, uh, you know, I guess Brian was not doing some shows, and Axel came in there. He did a pretty good job, you know, for, for coming. I in. heard. I saw a clip somewhere, and he's Axel. Man, he sounds great, but he's he singing like ACDC. But the little clip I heard, it's like maybe a minute long. And, uh, and that's hard. That's not oh easy. Oh, my God. Imagine going filling those shoes. <sighs> yeah. Man. What went on that's in like, his uh, head? Yeah. Oh, that's, wow. that's like, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to do. But ACDC, back in black right here, everybody. Yeah. Great album. Great <laughs> album. All right. Let's go. Let's take that out, okay. out of the way right now. That's definitely a good one. Number two, we're getting close. We're getting close over here. And uh, thanks for spending the time with us, James. Heck yeah, me. man. You, you kidding? Know? You know, and if I'm not getting too personal, you know. Oh, I dude. Mean, I mean, you just close something. You want. We could talk okay. about anything. No, but it's good. It's fun. It's fun. This is all, everybody watching, this is not rehearsed. This is very um, casual. And um, mm -hmm. we do make a good pair. I think we could do a good show together, you and I. Yeah, you know? dude. Uh, I, I could, uh, you, uh, you're, I uh, think, a guy that talks more than I do. <laughs> well, that's a positive though, because you everything you you're bringing up and stuff is right up my uh, my in, in my what, whatever you call it, right up my alley, so to speak. Uh, you know what? We could have had a band together when we were living in California together. You and I, it would have been uh, maybe not get nothing done, but <laughs> but okay. So number two, number two. What is your number two one? Uh scorpions. Ultra, uh, ultra forward. unbreakable. You got unbreakable coming in there right now. I got to go now, this album was the 15th studio album by Scorpions, and it was yeah. released in 2004. And you are you, you're a part of this record as well. Oh, dude, big time. By then, I'd been in the band for for long enough, and I felt like I was part of the band because we did the the uh, 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 here my Kentucky coming out, eye to eye album, and mm -hmm. you know toured on that, and then we went and we did a the orchestra album with us with the Berlin Philharmonic, which was phenomenal, wow. and then we did an acoustica album called Acoustica, and that took up three years or or if not more, and both those albums are just great, and uh, I'm super proud of those because I really did play drums on them, and wow. uh, you you never know anymore, um, and then. They go, you know what? We've done all this. We've done that. Let's go back to really what Scorpions is all about. And that's where Unbreakable came from. And Rudolph had been messing around with it. He was always playing some song in rehearsal or here and there. And man, that album just came together really fast. And um, we go to Rudolph's work. And then 
I would take a copy of whatever we were working on, go back to the hotel, chill out, and there's nothing. It's, this is out, outside of Hanover in this little town where he lived. And uh, there's nothing. Everything, they roll the, the carpets up, at uh, the sidewalks up at, you know, 8 o'clock. And uh, there's nothing going on out there. So, I, man, I'd just sit around writing lyrics, writing lyrics. And uh, Klaus used them, man. I was like, he goes, oh, these are great. And didn't change one word. And then another set of lyrics I gave him. The only thing he he came along and wrote a bridge to it, and and then there was a third one. And I was like, "Wow, here's Klaus is singing my lyrics on on the album." And because that you know you're there at the, hanging out all day, and then Klaus yeah. for a couple hours, and you know that was a great album, man. I, I love it. I'm very very proud of it. Not just from the songwriting aspect. But just my my per, my personal drumming performance and just the songs and and that's when I was like, oh, okay, this is Scorpions, you know. And uh, we kind of got and everybody was thrilled with the album because it kind of got back to Scorpions roots. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I have over here this song right here. And tell me a little bit about this. Let's see if I can pull this up right here. The stabs you in the back. Oh. In the back. Well, well, God. I wrote that. Love them or leave them. And <laughs> uh, love them or leave them. And what was funny is, um, I, I, you know, if this is one where Klaus used all my lyrics and didn't change a thing, not even a word. And I, but I explained it. Those guys, English is great. But he goes, love them or leave them. I, I don't, I don't get it. I go, well, it's like, okay, you try to explain it, <laughs> um, or like, I. Okay, well, how do you explain that? Love them or leave them. It's kind of like, well, you can't take what I'm dishing out, then F you and I'm off or whatever it may be. So that took a, a he's, a, Klaus is super smart and intelligent, but there's some phrases that it still escaped him. And I go, you know, love them or leave them. Like you kind of go, like, go uh, F off or whatever. Or like, uh, you, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, some things don't translate the same as regular English, and that's a very, I think, Americanized type phrase. Uh, you know, love them or leave them. Would you in the studio when you since you're writing the words, and would you would you give coach him on any phrasing? Like, hey, you, oh, no, you, want, no, no he, you let him he, do his thing. He, he came. He would come into to Rudolph's, and we we'd have a track down. This is before we go into the studio studio because Rudolph's studio is phenomenal, and uh, but we couldn't make an album there. So we go into the studio in Hanover and do it there. But Klaus would come in and go sing like, like syllables, no words, nothing that really made any sense. I knew what he was doing. And I've done that many, many times on, on songs I've written where I you don't have lyrics finished. And sometimes you don't want to finish it. You want to listen to it for a while. And then all of a sudden it pops into your head. And that was one where I took it back to the hotel and it just all just... 10 minutes later, here's love them or leave them. Wow. And uh, Klaus, I, I never, I don't think I hardly ever said anything to him once about singing ever. I'm like, oh, ever. it's Klaus. <laughs> he'll, he'll come up and he'll make it better. And uh, he was great at taking direction, like from a producer or, you know, Rudolph would say some things here and there, but I never had the inkling to even say anything. Cause he always got it. He always did it. He was always Klaus. He's great, man. Now, now, just approaching, the, bringing a song, were you nervous at first? Oh, you know, bringing your song to them? Or they said, hey, throw us what you got. They were open. Yeah, well, I've been in the band uh, long enough. And, uh, you know, of course, I, I would show Rudolph first. In 2008, I co-wrote on two songs. And that was an, an, a great album. It was just, uh, you know, it was the timing. We were being pressured to make an album like that until on uh, the, what's the name of that album? <laughs> 2008 um and we did that with desmond child and we, it was a lot of songs from desmond and they took songs from scorpions that and they just kind of twisted and turned them up and there was james michael was was one of the writers on that james and, michael right? that played with 6 a.m yeah he's a, he's a producer songwriter first yeah. he, 6 a.m was a fluke because he was doing some songs with nikki uh, at his studio and they made a band who knew and um and i knew dj ashburn gosh when he first moved to la in the whatever i actually went and did some gigs with dj's band he had him and the singer Chaz west who's phenomenal i know Chaz, who who was also in uh jason bonham's band exactly and and i played with him in a band called thrust 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Tough. And we played, you know, all the hard rock hits and stuff. So that was where uh, I got off track. But that's where um, we. I was working with James Michael and Desmond was. He was his thing was vocals, and um, um, on on the two thousand eight, I got off track. We no, it's okay. Uh, I know. I tend to do that. Me too. Um, me too. We'll help each other here. Uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the uh, Un Unbreakable was just a really phenomenal album to, to get back to that. Yeah. No, it's so cool that you just the writing with these cats and stuff. So, oh my God. You, now, when you were you just loose, did you have all oh, everybody had their ideas? Would you jam together with, with everybody in, as a um, band? Or, well, it was it was odd because, well, not odd, but Rudolph was the guy who it was he'd always go, Here, I have something new. And he'd press play on his on his in his studio, it would be a guitar with a drum machine or a, yeah. with a loop. And then we'd work it up and we'd play it. And, um, and Matthias is a guitar wizard guy and he put his icing on the cake. And the next thing you know, here's this incredible track. Because either way, no matter what, it sounds like Scorpions because it's Rudolph. And Matthias wrote quite a bit too, man. And um, it would just we'd magically come together. I mean, right before your eyes, oh, here's a brand new song. And then wow. Klaus would come over and uh, you know he already had the track from what Rudolph had made, he come in. Next thing you know, it really sounded like Scorpions. Yeah, that the signature, point. the signature vocal that I yeah, sound. And when you know, with that, for for writing lyrics for myself, it was very easy because I here I've got classes, uh, a vocal going in my head. Like, how would he sing that? How would what's he going to sound like doing that? And that therefore made it much easier to write lyrics for the, the song. Plus, yeah. I already had a, a scratch melody put down. That's funny. It's just funny how you explain the lyrics and the story of the song to him. This is, you know. Yeah, you know, but like I said, he was just like on, he goes, you know, my English is really good. I just don't get that phrase. And I try to explain it many different ways. He got it. I mean, he, like I said, he's a really smart guy. But yeah. uh, it was uh, it was funny. Something you never think about. No, no, it's kind of cool. I mean, you the, the, the classic <laughs> rock stars, you know, classic rock and roll, yeah. stuff that we grew up with, great music. I mean, They've been around a long time, the Scorpions. Like I, it's, I think it's 50 years since Rudolph started the band, like next year or something like that. Yeah, and, very, uh, they, very they, cool. It, man. And, and, you know, don't forget early John Roth was there for for, yeah. for all the big albums before uh, before the, uh, the um, what's that? The, the big, like Sting in the Tail, or not Sting yeah. in the Tail, that's a Swiss the Which one? one I, I'm think I might be thinking one with the forks on the on the. Yeah, blackout and then blackout. the one with the no one like you and all those songs. What a great song, man! <laughs> and you know what was killer is we uh, well, well, yeah, I was at that, you know in my early club days in the early '80s and mid up to through mid '80s, you know I was playing in all these bars. And my bands, we all played Rocky Like a Hurricane, No One Like You, blah, 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 and all those songs. And then when I totally. flew over, they go, well, would you, you know, manager calls and says, hey, would you be interested in coming over and, and uh, having a play with the boys? I'm like, going, sure. So I go in. These are songs I've already been playing for years. Totally. Uh, I mean, those that music was great. I lost my virginity to No One Like You. I don't even know. <laughs> I mean, it's great. Here's a great picture of you right there with everybody. Right ah. there. Where, uh, who knows where that was but it looks i don't know if it's are you doing the, the, the oh no guitar no guitar center is that guitar so, center yeah guitar center rock walk of fame and ironically look at the background it's mickey d hold on oh yeah right, right behind my head is mickey oh, is, and, and behind mickey is carmine apathy right yeah Car and then also lemmy was there and lemmy did the uh, actual induction which was totally cool Funny. So, okay, in the picture, can you tell everybody who's in the picture now so they know? Uh, looking at the watching. photo from left to right, that's Pavel, our bass player, Pavel Masivoda, of course, uh -huh. Rudolf Schenker, then Klaus Mina, Matthias Yabs, it's not Jabs, Yabs, yes. and then yours truly. Yeah, that was a wonderful day. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, and, you know, um, when <laughs> we went to, to do the pre pretend, we, we did really did our, put our hands in there, and then... Uh, um, and they had all they had made a big one up 
Uh, and they, of course, they spelled my name wrong. <laughs> oh, did they really? Oh, that's and funny. The and, and they're like, oh, oh, we'll fix it. We'll fix it. I was down there uh, probably, I don't know how many years ago. And I just happened to be going in Guitar Center for something. And wow. uh, look, they never fixed it, of course. That's oh. funny. That's funny. What a cool, it's a great picture. I mean, that's funny that he's in the background. Nikki's in the background over there. And so yeah. Lenny was at that. Wow. Lemmy was there. Not Lenny. Lemmy. Le Lemmy. Lemmy. I, said, I hope I said Lemmy. Yeah. Yeah, that's no, cool. No, you introduced us, man, and uh, inducted us into the Rock Walk of Fame. Wow. That's pretty cool. Uh, I know who else to better to do it. Than... I mean, that's that's rock and roll right there, man. Yeah. So are you are you now with the, with the guys in Scorpions? You guys all in, in good, you know? Oh yeah, yeah, we're, we're good. good. Yeah, we're totally friends. Um, you know, we talk via email here and there. I went to see him play uh, in Los Angeles. Um, I want to say maybe about three years ago. It was the first time coming through with Mickey, and uh, yeah. plus I'm friends with all the Road Crew guys. You know, I was super tight with those guys and uh, went down and seen them and they were great, you know, and, and you know, visited with Klaus and the, the guys and we said hello. And I just talked I talked to Rudolph just a couple weeks ago on online about something. And, um, you know, great, great I, I never player. had any harsh feelings or anything about it. It just kind of it just kind of I was there for 21 years. And were you there for 21 years? Yes. Wow. And by in my calculations, that's like 150 in rock and roll. A lot of water under the bridge. And um, our manager passed away about four years ago, four years before I got out of the band or five years ago. And uh, then just a few months later, our tour manager passed away. And, and then from then on, uh, uh, there was a... Uh, they, they never got a real manager manager. The lawyer man guy came on kind of like manager and it was just kind of not the same. And I never said a word, but yeah. uh, it just ran its course, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, so how did you end up getting the gig with him? What happened with the original drummer Herman? What happened with him? He was, he was, uh, he was leaving the band <laughs> to start a record label, of course, which everybody was doing in the nineties. Oh. And, um, uh, the uh, like I said, the manager just called me one day. The phone rang out of the blue. He goes, "Hey, this is Stuart manager, the uh, uh, Stuart manager, St uh, Stuart, the manager for Scorpions, and uh, the guys were wondering if you'd be interested in coming over and having a play." I'm like, going, yeah. oh, "Of course, you know." And uh, I, I go, "Can you uh, answer me this? Why, um, why would they, why they call me?" They go. Well, for one, you're a really good drummer, but they remembered you were a really nice guy. And I, I, that made me just melted me. And I was like, oh, oh well, see, nice guys don't always finish last. Yeah. You know, all yeah. my days like everybody else, but that was like really cool. That is cool. Do you yeah. remember, how about, how about your first, I don't know, even know if it's an audition, but the first time you jammed with them actually in the room, what, do you remember that? Uh, you know, um, went in there and you know the road crew guys are hanging around and here's rudolph and i'm like hey you know good to see you blah 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 and um you know it's like rocky like a hurricane and then was no that the first played. song was that the first song you played yeah. with them yeah and big or big city nice was was one of the top ones we played and i knew all those songs really well anyway but i've been brushing up and air drumming and you know it was, so, so it was, it was really interesting so hold on so the kid from Kentucky playing with your friends. Let's just for one second, playing them at the bar, the local bar, right? You know, yeah. with the people in there. From now, you're in the room with the guys. Did that uh, did surreal? You, right? It's surreal. Like I was just I was just playing these songs with a Budweiser light right over somebody's <laughs> head in a pool table, and now yeah. I'm in this room. You know? Yes. Just, wow. Like, I, 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 I find it surreal more often than you think and it's it's just pretty trippy man oh it's and, so uh, cool they made me like, go I... home and uh you know it just i stayed there for a while and we played a lot more and then worked on a couple new new songs and and uh hey we're doing this tour starting in may you know would you be interested and i was like <laughs> let me check my schedule of course yeah and very so cool look we started just look at this. Debbie says James is so amazing. Thank you, Debbie. It's oh. very sweet of you. Very good, oh, Steve. Debbie, uh, the money cash is in the mail. 
Yeah, yeah. Steve so, says learned a lot tonight. Mitch Weissman, right there. Thumbs up. Thank you, you Mitch, very much. Very cool. Great well, people you. here in the chat. Thanks for listening. Here. Yeah, great. Xandra over here. She's uh, first Scorpion album I ever bought was Worldwide Live. Love the message. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Virgin Killer, yeah. great record too. Yeah. So what would now give me while we're still doing our countdown here, give me your top five. Can you do it offhand? Scorpion songs that you love. Yes, uh, it, for, uh, uh, the number five was the Ramones. All the uh, no, 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 no. Five Scorpion songs I want to hear right now, just to throw it out, just to oh, throw it randomly. Yeah, five of your oh. favorite Scorpion songs. Um, uh, well, obviously, Rocket Like a Hurricane, No One Like You, I'm Leaving You is my number one top favorite song from Scorpions. I love that song. I used to bug them all the time. Come on, let's do. It. I'm leaving you. That and uh, um, ah, dang it. I don't want to say, obviously, no one like you and those guys. I'm trying to think of something. Uh, well, love them or leave them. I said that. But, um, God, there's so many. This is really they, tough. They got a lot of hits. Oh, my God. And even the stuff that aren't the hits. Um, I just, there's so many great songs. Um, we had a song on the, 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 uh, on the orchestra album, which is uh, Hurricane 2000. We, we did with the Brill in for a harmonic. There's a song on there. It's it's a big ass sappy love song called Here in My Heart. And I remembered it because Diane Warren, the Oscars were last Sunday. And I, never, I don't watch those shows much, but Diane Warren was going to be on. And she, because she wrote it, she was nominated for a song on there. And she wrote Here in My Heart, which we put on that album. It's just a beautiful, beautiful love song. I love that song. And I forgot about it. You know, that's that's one of the problems is, you do so many albums and do so many years, you forget about this and that. I should have looked up some stuff before I came no, on here. This, this is cool. You'll come back again. I'll have you back again. I love that. Oh, yeah, Jay. This is great. You know what? Klaus has one of those vo vo vocals that makes a love song so – he has a beautiful tone to it when he's doing a ballad. He oh, my does. God, yeah. He could sing, you know, super loud and super quiet. And whisper and everything in between, and that's what makes a great singer a great singer. I mean, I can sing one way, and that's loud on ten, and that's it. And it's usually going to sound like this. However, I, I was thrilled to death over all the years I was playing live. I did virtually all the background harmonies, and I'm like, oh, many times just going, I'm singing with Klaus. I'm singing with Klaus. You would I'm do the wow, wow. So in the studio doing the harmonies, when you guys would rehearse, would he be like? Is he like that type of guy in the studio? Uh, you're, you're flat. You're hot, too high. Is, is he? No, like his... he let the producer do the job. But when it was just us, uh, again, a lot of the stuff got done. He would come over, sing, hang out for a bit, and like most singers, he would split because they're sitting there messing around with their guitars, and you know he only has so much patience. Yeah, but um. No, he he. I don't remember him once ever going, correcting me when I was doing some of my vocals because he still did the majority of them. But then we would add my vocal too because I, I they didn't really care for uh, a, a lot of bands that where the vocalists did all the background harmonies too. Although they did it a lot, yeah. they weren't fond of it. And um, so we always we did. And Rudolph sang on a lot of stuff too. And then we all did gang vocals. We all be up. Do the game. Great. Oh man, great. Man, what a great, what a what a great gig. What great stories you have. And I, I've noticed so many more. Which yeah, what's your fondest memory of being with the Scorpions? What's your the one memory you have of playing with them? Is there one oh, that sticks out? Um we actually headlined in this was in Poland. I, I'm not sure the city. I want to say Krakow, that's where our bass player is from. And we went to play this show and um they go, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be like 120,000 people there. We're like, oh yeah, right. Yeah. Cause it was out at a big airfield. And we're like, oh yeah, sure, sure. So we got there and it was, it was pretty much getting dark uh, already. And, you know, we went there, we did our, our pre show stuff, whatever. We went out and played and then, uh, you know, you're just playing, you can't, you know, you can only see so far, but it was set up like a big, uh, like a festival. And so then we're going back to, we go back to the hotel. Oh no, the next day they go, hey, you know what? Uh, you know how many people were there? We're like, um, 100,000. They go, no, there were 650,000 people there. And we're like, oh, what? And we freaked out. And so that was for, to see the Scorpions. Nobody else played that day. And 650,000 people at one 
show. I, I that always blew me away. That was crazy. We played so many wonderful things and did so many things. I, I mean, we you know we played all over Russia and everywhere in between. And uh, you know, Russia's massive. There's eleven yeah. home zones in Russia. You know, we got four or five here, and we went all the way from you know Saint Petersburg over to Vladivostok, which is right next to Japan, and uh, everywhere in between, and we, and uh, multiple multiple times. So, I mean, there's so many highlights, you know, we did tons of TV and uh, things that you wouldn't think a, a regular hard rock yeah. band would do, but we did everything, you know, did I remember, everything. yeah, I remember doing the one TV or an award show or some, one of those. And uh, it was really cool because we, we were, got to hang in the audience and we were getting the Lifetime Achievement Award or whatever it was. And it was a really, really cool show. And Katy Perry came out and played. I've never heard of Katy Perry. Who's she? She got up and played with acoustic. And then she exploded, you know. And, uh, you know, it's a, a, a to Z, everything in between you could think of. And yeah. I'm really grateful and uh, thankful I was able to do it. You know, gosh, you know. It's great well, now. It's, you know, it's great. A little footnote here. Mm -hmm. One of the other reasons how I got in Scorpions, I did an album with Michael Schenker. I did the third Macaulay Shanker album with Rob Macaulay, Michael Shanker, and Jeff Pilson was on bass. He's one of my all-time bass, bass players. And we did an album, and they knew about that. And Michael's great, man. That was killer. We, we did the whole thing from pre-production, all in, recording. Everything was done in like nine days. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's incredible. <laughs> and <Jeff> Michael, <laughs> it was great. You'd never see him around. He'd just walk into the studio, sit down, start playing. It was like, oh, wow. He's great. I'm proud of that album too, man. Uh, very God, you've done so much, man. Debbie Mola is right here. Thank you very much for the super chat. I love this interview. James is an absolutely ta uh, talented legend. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Debbie. Thank you, yeah. Debbie. Debbie, very that's very cool. God, I mean, you've done a lot of cool stuff. Even looking at your your track record, because over here, before we go to your number one over here, you you I want to know Ronnie Montrose. Oh my God. Tell that was weird. My band from Louisville. We, uh, our manager, who was in Nashville, calls one day and says, "You'll never guess. Guess what? Uh, I, I, I think I got you guys a tour with Ronnie Montrose." We're like, going, "What?" He was like our hero, I, even I, at the time. And because we had PA lights and the whole deal, Ronnie would come out. I, I mean, we'd come out play. We had PA lights, and we we were a pretty big draw around the region. Uh, from Florida all the way up to Michigan. And uh, we provide lights PA and we, we you know, open for Ronnie. It's like, wow, wow. So we finished that tour and about a few weeks later, phone rings, it's our singer. And he goes, you won't believe this. I go, believe what? He goes, Ronnie Montrose wants us, me and you to come out and play on his new album. I go, what? And I like literally dropped the phone. And, I, and because he was doing that tour to try out all of his new material. So I thought, well, it'd be the drummer and um, singer, but he brought instead he got brought me in our singer and from my band, and uh, oh. went out to San Francisco. Was there for two weeks, and here I'm in the studio. Man, he taught me so much about hard rock drumming that because I, I thought I knew everything already, and man, he was just a goldmine of information. And and uh, he ended up producing my band from Louisville. And uh, he did a five song demo for us, but we just couldn't get arrested. We just couldn't get that one. We went to New York multiple times and stuff, but Ronnie, Hey man, it was amazing. It was amazing. Huh? You kept in touch with him too, huh? Oh yeah. Your, yeah. You know, Anytime he come, come through uh, uh, LA. I, I mean, I was there in a heartbeat and, yeah. um, and the actually the tech who was the tech from kingdom come, who was our only tech for our, our stage manager from day one till the end. He became Ronnie's tech. So I'd go see Wes and I'd go see Ronnie. And man, they were just great. Yeah. Yeah. And what a, what a player. Huge influence, man. If if anybody out there hasn't ever listened to Montrose, go out and just at least get the first album. The one with Sammy I, on. But he had so much great stuff. I saw him with Gamma here in Louisville. Uh, uh, and just great. Yeah, the quintessential cool. hard rock guitarist. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely, man. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, he was just one of the best. Uh, Eric Singer always talks very highly of him, and he did some stuff also, I think, with him. Yeah, I believe he did. Yeah. And and uh, 
I went down to see him once in down around Nam Show Tom, and I forgot who was playing drums. It wasn't Eric, but that, he always had a great band. And the singer who's now with Kingdom Come, uh, Keith St. John, I met Keith a gazillion years ago. I wanted him to be the singer for Wild Horses, but I got outvoted. We got somebody else. And then years later, Keith was the singer for Ronnie Montrose. So I go, see, I was right. Because <laughs> Ronnie was really hard on singers, and Keith was great, though, and still is. That's funny. That's funny. Wow. So then he ended up joining Kingdom Come, huh? Keith. Well, yeah, we I went after him like like crazy when it was time to get a, another singer. He was like our only. I mean, there's quite a few pe names came up, but Keith was at the top of my list always. I just thought he's a great singer. I think I have a picture over here for everybody to see. Let's see if I have it. I I think I have it right. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's the Scorpions. Right, right here. No, that's no, no, that's, no, no. Right here, right there. There it is. There we go. And right Keith's there. in the middle. For, and that's the original four from Kingdom Come with just with a different singer. And, uh, you know, we got, had got Lenny's blessing because Lenny was ready to go and we had some shows booked up. And uh, and then he called me a few months before the shows were to start. He goes, man, you know what? I just don't think I want to do it. You know, and I was like, I was like, oh, you're kidding because Lenny's great. Um, and um I'm like, well, it's not going to be really being kingdom come. But I'll tell you what, we we got no, um, we've had no like, oh, well, if Lenny's not the band, we don't want to buy the show. Just the opposite. I mean, we had out of about our first initial run was like about 22 or 24 shows. Only two of the promoters backed up because Lenny wasn't doing it. Len, so, oh, so, and who's yeah. in the band right in this picture? Who do we have here? That in, from in the, uh, left to right, looking at the picture, that's Danny Stagg. And that's yours truly. Key St. John, and that's Rick Steyer. He and I have been in uh, about a thousand bands together. And then Johnny B. Frank is on bass on, at the, on the end. He and looks the same. What? Johnny I, looks the same. He doesn't change. Dude, he doesn't. He just had a, a pretty big birthday. And man, he's in great shape. He takes care of himself. And everybody in the band does. All You yeah. know, the, the days of, you know, every six dogs and walk and low. That's been so long gone. I mean, we still have a blast. Everything's a blast. But, you know, it's you know it it doesn't work. <laughs> I, I don't want to say at this age it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm 26 in my head. <laughs> it doesn't work, Eric. You Bader, the same these, way. Right here, we got my buddy Eric. These stories are incredible. Thank you, thank you, Eric, for even and and Thanks, listening. Eric. Uh, Eric goes right here. I was just talking to a buddy of mine today about the Epic Kingdom Come vinyl. Played it today. Oh, well, there good. you go. Yeah, and that's uh, awesome. Tara was uh, is Kingdom Come touring this year, and uh, you know what is what? What, what's going on with the, those guys now? Well, uh, uh, Johnny had a little some issues. I had some issues with uh, 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 I fell out of bed in my sleep and I cracked like three or four ribs, and this was last July. And man, it took forever to recover. I cracked three and broke one. And that was really rough. And then um, I came here to Louisville to visit my brother and sister. And lo and behold, about I was here for about eight, ten days. And I tripped and fell, and I cracked my left hip. <laughs> I know. Who knew? I'm like, well, that's what happens to old people. But you know, I was really hoofing it, man. I mean, I was going, and I, I was going to see the World World Series somewhere. And uh, this is it, it's healing. I'm right on schedule. I've done tons of follow ups, yeah, and physical therapy and all that stuff. But we did have two shows in February uh, where I had uh, somebody fill in. And I was really bummed about that. I, I never missed anything. And I, I probably could have done the shows, but I felt it better not. And, yeah. um, and you know, I, I, for the last, I mean, I've been going to, to uh, it, it's physical therapy, but it's chiropractor slash massage. Um, they put these electrode things on you. I've been doing that three weeks for like the last four weeks, five weeks. And this week's my last week of that. And I had follow-up appointments and this and that. And I'm right on uh, schedule. And I, you know, I feel great, but I'm uh, learning to not push it because they said, "Look, man, if you don't do all this stuff in the beginning," they told me, "You could end up with with a, walking with a limp for the rest of your life." I said, "Uh, uh I ain't doing that." Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So I really listened close to this. You you got it. to listen to your body. I mean, I, would Eric, I talk to Eric Singer? He goes gets the, the, a massage and all that, and he has a guy oh, taking yeah. care. Of, and he goes, he goes, you don't understand. He goes, you know, you do what I do, and you don't understand how hard it is. And it's a it's a physical, and I do under I get it. It's physical. It's it's a lot, man. It's a yeah, lot. Yeah, man. Body. And, you know, go go do an iron forty five minute kiss show, man. It it take it take it out of you. It's not just the physicals 
all this and stuff and whatever, and I'm singing whatever. It's it's the mental uh, concentration too. You because yeah. uh, you got to do the exact same thing almost every single time. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I seldomly changed my stuff up with Scorpions, and I'm sure Eric does the same thing, man. I mean, I saw him with Kiss a few years back in in Germany. Just great. Just yeah. phenomenal. Him and Tommy Thayer. And I mean, you know, of course, Gene and Paul, you got that. But Eric and Tommy have made that band. I saw them uh, in um, Los Angeles out at the whatever place out there, uh, Glen Helen, whatever. And it was the first time I'd seen them in years. And uh, with it was with Tommy and uh, Eric. And I was just like, wow, they've never sounded better. Uh, they do a great job, you know. Yeah. Every, you know, they get slack. You know, everybody, everybody is is a critic out there, but they do, you know, they do a great. And even Gene and Paul, for the age that they're at, to wear that armor, the st with the pyro going on, it's Dude. man. You know, let's see your family at that age doing what Dude, they're no doing. Kidding. And they got these fifty foot high boots, totally. And, they're, and they're, they have to act and just everything involved with. I mean, they be, have been doing it forever, so it's second nature. But man, yeah, that's a tall order. And and, and what they're doing is they're bringing your memories back again. You're oh, they're making you old. feel because we're all older now. Like, look, I'm fifty five now. You know, everybody's become. We're at that age where back in the day, Sunset Strip, we wouldn't even. People of us, we go, oh, they're so old. You know, when we were hanging uh, out the Sunset Strip, you and I, you know, yeah. back, back in the day, we look at somebody like our age now. Oh, stay nah, you're man. old, dude. But right? 55 now is, is it's kind of like 35. Totally. Uh, then, and you know, it, it, it's all, it's all relative. It's like, you know, um, I mean, I'm not telling anybody something that don't, probably don't already know. Rudolph is turning 70 this year. And same Klaus is just, just uh, I think it'll be 71, but it's all about, it's up here and staying in great shape. Rudolph, it was, was so disciplined about it. everything. We'd be at his house and we'd be playing and he would just stop sometimes in the middle of the song and we'd stop and go, what's up? He'd go, I must go make training. <laughs> what? Really? I must go make training. Yeah. He goes, I'll be, you know, and he got to the garage. The first time he did it, we were all look kind of like, huh? And um, he got to the garage and worked out for like 45 minutes. No way. Come back <laughs> and we pick up right where we left off. But he was really disciplined like that. And it, a lot of it rubbed off on me. And, you know, um, that's a good thing. It's a, a, it's our party months. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's a good thing that they're like that, you know? Yeah. And, and Klaus is like, you know, singers in general, I mean, they're all pretty freaky about germs and this and being you know taking care of themselves in class very rarely did we ever have to cancel the show um because he lost his voice and he was yeah. super disciplined as well and uh you know it rubs and off he, on me he takes it he, you know and he still looks great he looks he does you know he yeah. looks great klaus he does i mean yeah, god, does. Bless, god bless those cats and and the kiss show look i have over here i, I see uh comments um uh, that Kiss still does a great show. Uh, Tara had put in there, and they yeah. do. They they still do a great show. It's going to be sad that the the end is coming. I know uh, movie. They actually, you know, they if if COVID hadn't come, they would have been done by now. Been done. You know that, and uh, um, I'm like going hmm because I saw they're playing in L.A. and I was like going hmm I, that's going to be next impossible to get in. Tickets for are going for like three four grand, and uh, I don't even know how how they're doing on comps because I've, I've I, I can't remember the actually I do remember last, last time I bought a ticket to a concert uh, was Rolling Stones in like 93. Oh, and, and I'm like, oh, because well, I'll, well, I'll buy a ticket for Rolling Stones and when went and they were phenomenal, man. Oh my god, this poster right here is when the Stones played oh, Vegas, uh, T Mobile 2016. and. And I bought that there, but it was a free show. And that was very random. Eric Singer, and Eric, if you're watching, thank you very much. He called me up and he goes to me, you want to see the Stones? He goes, my friend, uh, because he's a watch guy, as you know, Eric. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he, Zenith Watch, they were doing a watch for the Stones. So this watch guy who's big into rock, prog rock, fan of Derek Sherinian, uh, Eric got me tickets, so I had to drive from California to Vegas for that show. It was like, we got to go to my wife oh, if you want to see it. Nice drive. <laughs> and there was a backstage uh, world and with food, but the Stones weren't there, but the watch was, and it was free. Great seats, and I got that. It was a great time. And uh, 
Wow. The, the, yeah, it was. And Eric, thank you very much. So I got to see the stones there. Because of Eric Singer, when we were doing our um, Glam Nation gigs around those times, right. it was another time that we got to see uh, the stones. This was a funny one. They played the felt that not they played the forum in, in Los Angeles. It was a private party. And it was when Clinton was president and he, <laughs> he, he introduced, <laughs> he, he, don't get, don't, don't no, say no, nothing. <laughs> Wait, hold on. He introduced the stones and it was Bill a Clinton? private, yeah, Bill Clinton. It was a private party. And I went with Eric and, uh, I think we had to do a show or something. I could we only stayed for like six songs. We had to go play a gig at the oh cat club, God. and I was so upset. But I got to, so a couple of times I got to see the Stones for free from the Eric Singer connection, and that was Eric Singer when he wasn't in Kiss the first time. The that first, time he was okay. The four that time he was. Yeah, the I got first time there was so many great bands. Yeah, you there's know. so many great, great shows. Man, this is cool to talk with you, James, and to reminisce all these stories and put it all together to all the different degrees oh of all the yeah. people that you, you know, that you've done. And I like and- it, man, because you know rock and roll. I mean, I, you know, I've done tons of uh, of interviews over the years, and some guys get it, some don't. Some and you don't really get it. And it makes it such a pleasure, it makes it fun. I'm like going. This is actually I'm working. <laughs> no, be- this is no, this is cool, dude. This is so much. This is a fun time to, yeah. to talk with you as well. On on as a drums, what are you what are you playing these days for your drums these days? Well, I switch. Uh, like I said, I switched to D drum, and okay. I still got two bass drums. I only use the right one. Uh, one rack, two floors, bunch of cymbals, and uh, I, like I said, I, I switched. Actually, <laughs> the guy from D drum, who's also the head of Dean Guitars, and um, and PV, um, he kept bothering me. I mean, I see him at the NAMM show like every year. This went on for like three, four years. Finally, I was like going, hmm, Dean Guitars plus D Drum. So if I go to D Drum, I could probably get some D Guitars. And uh, that was kind of my uh, ulterior motive for going with D Drum. Because I, I, quite honestly, anymore, you know, I, I, I even with good drums, I was always triggering. Yeah. Um, because so the sound man has options and some halls it's one way and more acoustic ones sometimes it's less and uh so i was like oh well i'm triggering anyway so i got the d drums and they're great really good quality stuff man i don't know why some people say they aren't i always thought they're great so and, you um, yeah so you're yeah. a fan you're a fan you love them. what was your first drum kit that you had oh my god uh i had a a kick snare rack floor Slingerland kit and two Zildjian cymbals and some weirdo hi hats that I bought from my, my my brother's best friend. I bought them for fifty bucks, and I really wish I'd never got rid of them. I, of course, and I painted them at some point blue, and and I'm uh, I wish I had that little kit. That was great. That's, that's funny. I want to ask you a personal question, really yes, quick, because you know the whole family thing with you, you know Athena. The brother-in-law, Tommy. Do you yeah. guys ever? You ever guys ever go into a room together? Maybe you had a family. There was like a holiday, and there's drum set up, and you and Tommy Lee had a showdown together with each other. On Not the- really. <laughs> okay. I mean, he we go over there, you know, for for actual holidays like Thanksgiving and blah blah blah. Yeah. And one one year, yes, he did drop the whole turkey on the floor, and we didn't tell anybody. Did he wait? Hold on. He he dropped the t- Tommy. And he's taking the turkey out of the oven. And somehow just it just slid off the platter, and he goes, "I oh, looked at each other, and we took it and put it back on the platter." And put it together. Kind of cleaned it up. Yeah, no, that uh, he did this crazy drum thing, uh, and he t- was taken to some theater, and he had, um, I think Matt Swarm was involved, and a few other drummers. And he had like four drum sets up there, and a few other things. And I, I didn't, I wasn't involved because I think I was gone, and. Uh, he goes, yeah, man, I would have asked you, but you, I, I just got home. I couldn't have done it anyway. Yeah, uh, but I wanted to see that, and but no, it was never like, oh, let's go down and clash some drums. Uh, you no, know, he had a great that. studio at his house. Yeah, and, he had a nice studio at the house. Oh, great! Yeah, his whole house is is pretty bitching. It's pretty and, cool. Um, huh? Yeah, man, he recorded all of his albums there and stuff. And uh, I mean, it's a great, great studio. And yeah. but we never like, it, you know, it's kind of like it just never was. I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, Debbie Mo, you see, I did this for Debbie Muller, the fan of it. She wants to know these questions. She has to know if, if you if you ever if you ever had to show Tommy a little trick or something or a note, you know, if you ever asked, hey, how do you do this or that or what are you doing? No, here? I, no. actually though, he he came to see us. Uh, Scorpions, we were playing at Universal Amphitheater, and he came uh, that night, and and oh, that's right. For some reason that that night, Athena went back to the hotel early. Here he comes. He said, "Oh." Where's Athena? What's going on? Blah blah blah. And, he, and we were hanging out, and uh, so I go up to do my drum solo, and he, I, and I, because I, I told him in advance, I go, look, when I'm doing my drum solo, just come on up and start beating on something. He came up and just started wailing on my floor tom. So we actually did a solo together. You and, did uh, it, huh? That's oh, cool. That was cool, man. He hits hard, man. I know, I know <laughs> he hits hard. <laughs> but uh, what's funny is he uses pretty really small sticks, but he slams, man. He's oh really? Really? So his sticks, huh? Yeah. So he must be breaking those sticks and all the way he hits. I don't know. I, I right. I, I don't know. I I think he finally switched to those head sticks that I use, the black ones, and you can unscrew the tip and take the thing off and put it on your brand new stick. I've been using those. I was like one of the very first guys that ever got them, and because my friend, uh, he worked for uh, what's the people who make baseball bats. Not oh. not, not a little slugger. Um, they made aluminum bats mm -hmm. and they made uh, hockey sticks. And he what made hockey sticks and developed this crazy drumstick made out of graphite. The stuff they make the hockey sticks out of. He goes, dude, try these. And I was like, well, these are great. I never used wood again. You never used wood. I wonder if I have any drumsticks here. Hold on, I don't know. I thought I had. Uh, no, I probably sent them to someone. I thought I had some Eric Singer dr drums. What? Oh, that was my. What was? Oh, sorry about that. That was. Um, that, that was Elvis. Thank you. <laughs> oh, hey, Elvis. Oh, that, that was my Elvis thing. I thought I had some drumsticks here. Okay, now we talk about drums, and 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 this drummer was probably a big influence of you growing up. You're number one. We're gonna go to number one now. Everybody, you're all waiting for number one. No, I changed. <laughs> you changed. Oh, it? oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. What am I? How can I forget? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Okay, okay, so. Now we are going to go to number one. Everybody's waiting. I got crazy. I went off the page. I, I love talking with James. James is a lot of fun to talk with. And this is, we're both together. Yeah. I remember we're, in your email, you'll, yeah, man, we do like, you know, about 20, 25 minutes. <laughs> like, 25 minutes right now. Your family's going, you, you're with this schmuck in the show. What the hell? Oh. Get him out. Go. <laughs> but, we're having a great time here. But anyway, number one right now, everybody, it is that number one song. What is number one for you, man? Grand Funk live album, and it's so phenomenal. It changed my life. Oh, that's a great album. That's a great album, the Grand I Funk. I, I, you know, I, I grew up, we had like about 10 eight-track tapes that uh, in this case, that's all we had. We could afford nothing. And uh, uh, there was James Brown Greatest Hits, Led Zeppelin for Sly and the Family Stone Greatest Hits, uh, whatever, and Grand Funk Live album. And I played along with that over and over, and that's how I learned how to do a drum solo, because Don Brewer was so fun. That album is great. The band is great. I think Three Piece, too. Oh. And uh, they finally added a keyboard player, but man, just, uh, just it's just, it, for those of you who aren't familiar with Grand Funk, other than Amer we're an American band, great song, yeah, nothing wrong with it. Um, I think Todd Rundgren co-wrote that and produced it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and but man, that album it just uh, it just turned me upside down. I just played it over because you know you could put an eight track tape play tape tape in the machine and would just keep going and going and going. I, I just left it in there for probably a year. <laughs> oh man, a, a great album! And and, and this album what it, it came out on uh, nineteen seventy. This was November. This album came out, and um, it was I knew it was around then. Yeah, yeah, it was the first live album by by Grand Funk Railroad. This record. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, it came out about 70 over here, but great record. Let's see if I could play a little bit for people out here. They could hear something for Second Rule. This is the bass. Oh, that's I was all. just going to say that to you. Listen to the yeah. bass, right? I know. He was one of the first guys I ever heard distorted bass, ever. And yes. and uh, that was, I think, me mistreat her. Um, and and they, in, they, in, quote, invented acid rock as we know it, if that's what you call it today. Yeah. They, were, yeah. they were the founders of Acid Rock. Everybody said, no, it was Black Sabbath. No, it was Grand Funk. 
And oh, great. Uh, yeah. some, one band, I think, that never got its notoriety where it should be. And they're still out touring. Bruce Kuhl, it's the, the guitar player for Grand Funk. That's right. There's two Grand Funks. I actually had the honor to have Bruce on the show many times. And I had Mark Farner on the show two times already. He's been on the show, which lovely guy. I, did, I was so nervous the first time I had Mark Slaughter do the interview. And Mark Slaughter with me. Oh, wow. Because uh, Mark's a big Grand Funk. And I go, Mark, you know what? Because Mark gave me this. He, Mark's a great guy. He did yeah, the theme yeah. song for me. Do you know Mark Slaughter? Yeah, uh, we met you... uh, several times out there. And uh, I know he lives in Vegas, I think. No, and, he moved. Uh, he's in that. He's, he's like, not that. He's like, yeah, he moved. But he, great guy. He gave me the mic. He's done so many things. I go, Mark, do me a favor. Come on, let's do the interview together. He actually did some work with, with, um, Mark Farner as well. Oh, and wow. that, yeah, because he's because Mark Slaughter is actually was a guitar player before a singer and he has a great studio on his house. But yeah, and uh fun interview. You know, they got the two bands split up. There's there's Mark Farner's Grand Funk, you know, and you got the other one, Don has his. But it'd be cool to see the guys at this point, just to you know I know. I, I always I say that about there's so many bands like that. It would be cool if uh uh I mean, even Rat, you know, here's Steve totally. Harris's Rat. And then you've got uh, Bobby. Well, they, Bobby hadn't been playing much lately, but just, you know, you don't have, all you have to do is play together on stage. You don't have to talk to each other. You, you stay at separate hotels, whatever. Just go do it, man. And uh, there's, there's in there two different great whites yeah, and this, this, a couple this, different L.A. Guns. There's something. a couple different L.A. Guns. I was in a, in a version of L.A. Guns. Uh, the, I, I was the 150th. I, I was the 150th birth. The the 150th bass player, I think, or something like that. I make a I make a joke out of it. You know, it used to be the band London. Everybody was in London. Remember back in L.A. Oh my that God, band? that's right. Yeah, everybody <laughs> right, played in London. You're right. Right. I, mean, I think Nikki uh, Six and, was and, in London. Right. And then Nader, Nader DePriest, the singer, he made his band called DePriest, and he kind of went the same route. They were it, there was guys coming and going constantly in that. Band. I think I think if you think about the names, I think Fred Curry might have been in London. If I'm mistaken, <laughs> right? Were you in London? Don't tell me. No. You were. <laughs> okay, okay, because no. <laughs> there'll be some breaking news. But it was like, but, but you never heard of, you didn't know anything they did, but. Public Enemy. Wait, was that a London song? Yeah, it was. It was uh, the guitar player, I think, wrote Public Enemy number one with Nikki Six, and then they brought the Motley Crue. Oh, and I didn't know that. How, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I remember huh. he played the coconut tease at that guitar play. He passed away. His name was uh, Lizzie. Yes, I forget the guy's name. I remember he played the teaser a, a yeah, long time ago. From, from, which guitar? From London. Um, oh, who, who, oh, oh. Yeah, London's guitar player. You know what? In the chat, I know there's Motley Crue. They will know what I'm talking about. I don't know. I'm not a connoisseur. I'll say everything wrong, and I'll get yelled at from some Motley Crue king fan oh, president no, no. guy. They'll, <laughs> they'll yell at me, and then, you know, I'll start a whole war. But there was Public Enemy number one was co-written, I think, with one of Nikki's bands before Motley Crue. I, I think. I think. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have my notes here. That sounds know. right. But, but, but anyway... There's the story right there. London, the band that everybody was in. It was almost like the Beatles had Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. It was that band that everybody would, would play in back in Liverpool or something. Yeah, Ringo, yeah, yeah. Ringo was in that band. There's always a band like that out there. Yeah. And um, so that that live album is the number one. Grand Funk, this is the number one album that of your top five, the must-have. So we have... <laughs> We have a pretty good then let's let's go down what we have so far. So you started out with the Ramones, all the stuff and more, volume two, everybody. James likes that one, which is a lot of great songs from Rockway Beach to Wanna Be Sedated. There's volume I, two. I don't know why. I, I think I had volume one on CD somewhere. And and I remember I was moving uh a few years years back, and I, I mean I wasn't doing the physical lifting, but yeah. the guys who were helping me was bringing all my stuff and they i had a big box of cds and somebody stole them while they were loading in and i was like oh, oh where's my box of cds they go oh, somebody must have taken it i'm like going oh oh and they, my I had, god I, it was a it was uh oh. collection man London was like the glam version of Menudo. Hey, see, <laughs> there, you, there, there you go. And uh, so we got that. And you know what? It's I like going down your top five because it's funny. You got to pick your number five with somebody I played with. 
and you love the you love the history and then oh, you yeah. got to tell me about your top five with people you played with and it's cool to, to learn these facts over well, what there. are your top five? Oh god you why do you do this to me you're, 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 you're the guest i can't interrupt you that's a that's yeah, a tough it's really i mean it's I, hard. I, I thought about this uh, for several days here and i wrote this when i changed a couple and um it's hard. It, loans in there. It, it's and, uh, but the Ramones. It's great. You know, it's funny on on. It's not on this album, but this is a compilation Ramones record. Your number five. I remember when I did when I played in Argentina, and I have a video of it uh, that nobody has. I have a bunch of videos. We all have things the people we played with. Yeah. And I need I need to to put it out there, do something with it. But um, Dee Dee would do Ward Hard, and he would grab the mic and he would take. He was playing guitar when i was in the band even though mm-hmm. for you guys out there that know ramones he was the bass player but he was playing guitar i was playing bass he was singing and my buddy christian martucci he was playing <laughs> guitar who's now in stone sour you also also plays with Corey taylor's band my stone friend. sour y'all. yeah great. yeah great band so my buddy christian martucci um he was the guitar player and uh, it was my friend anthony he was in a band called the throbs Back in New York, back in the day. The name. Do you remember, remember the drum? But but he was also in the band on Married with Children, the Gutter Cats, the rock band on that show. <laughs> he because he moved, he moved, and they were in that. But anyway, he he could play like Tommy Ramone. He could do that. So we're doing the show, and I'll never forget this. Dee Dee's doing Warthog, and he falls on the floor. And at the time, Dee Dee was maybe forty eight years old at this time because he was. 49 when he died he was going to be 50 he died in june oh, wow. he was going to be 50 in september but when we did the show i'm looking and i'm like and back then i i'd call him the old kook you know i'm 55 <laughs> i go and i go to christian i go the old kook died on stage he <laughs> fell and he wasn't breathing i'm like oh my god what do we do and we keep doing warthog no way. Oh, I mean, god, 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 you know what and we're just chorusing it out and we're looking and he's not moving i'm like what the and I'm going to Christian. Whoa, what hook? And he was, he's in my mic. I go, did he die? What the fuck's going on here? <laughs> it's not he funny, did, but and it wasn't. And then he gets up, like, like, like we walk off stage, and he goes, Go, the, the roadie, the tech comes, and he goes, Dee Dee comes backstage. He goes, I wanted them to think I was dead. I wanted them to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking <laughs> James, it was so punk rock. You cannot make it up. I wanted them to think I was dead. I wanted everybody to go home with a total it, straight face. With a total like, straight, he goes like, "Yeah, I want them to go home." I, they, I that's it. Because he stopped. <laughs> he was mad because in Argentina, how they appreciate you and love you for everybody watching here. They'll take, they'll spit in the hand and cup it and they'll throw it at you. And they're not being disrespectful. That's in Argentina. Yeah. They're showing they love you. You played Argentina, right? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And did they, did they spit at you I guys? Know. remember that. <laughs> I guess it's a punk rock thing. So when you're singing, what it'll go in your mouth. And oh. it's like, I, I went there two times. Uh, uh, was it two times? Yeah. I went, with the with Steven Adler, I went with him and get, but then I went with. Oh, that's Dean. right. You played with Steven too. I played with Steven God, too. Dang it, man. Yeah, and and Wait, who else do you play? You played with Dee Dee. Steven? I played with Dee Dee and 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 played played a version of LA Guns. Who did I play with? I'm trying to think now. Then I played with Ryan, but then I had that Starfuckers thing. It was like with me, Karabi, and it was an all star thing. So it and was Teddy, changing. And yeah, you it was Eric play Dover. Play. Eric Dover was the singer. You know yeah. Eric Dover. Yeah, he's great. He's great. It was Eric Dover. And then we um, sometimes Brian Tishy, sometimes it was Tommy Clefettis on drums. We'd have different people playing, you know, all the oh, time with drummer. us. Dizzy Reed was a part of the band. Oh, yeah, Dizzy. He's he's the only keyboard player in L.A. <laughs> him and Teddy. The only keyboard player, <laughs> you know. It's him and Teddy. <laughs> he's actually the longest man standing in Guns N' Roses besides Duff and Slash, that, Dizzy actually. Reed. And uh, I, I was like, wow, man, because I remember when he when he – when he joined Guns N' Roses, it was kind of like, oh, well, he's playing keyboards, playing, you know. And yeah. Oh, he is yeah. still there. He's still there. He's he. You know what, Dizzy is no drama. He's a good guy. 
He's a really? he's a he's a great guy. Um, really good good guy. You know, everybody that I played with in that Starfuckers band, then we called it Sunset Winos. It was it was like a family, and I'm still friendly. Like Slim Jim Phantom, we speak yeah. all the time. Great guy, uh, Eric Singer. You know, we're like Yentis too. We'll all like oh, get mad at each other, but all cool cats. Those guys are great on my hand. Those are like my close people I'm friends with. You know, yeah, Slim yeah, yeah. Tommy. You get a couple. In this business, as you know, James, there's a lot of fake people out there, and, and you and and you know who your friends are. Of course, you know? and, 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 and you know that's the the side that I think uh, go, you know uh, you'll hear you'll be me and go, man, it must just be great. Oh, you're, I mean, yeah, you're seeing the good part. You're not seeing all the the crapola and all the the scumbags and all the dirt bags and th that you have to go through to get to here. To, to hear, it's, it's not for everybody, man. I, I think the only worst is is, is acting. <laughs> and, uh, to, 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 totally, and, no, and Derek, I, yeah. I was dabbling because uh, I had some with all this time off. What am I going to do? And I was dabbling. I went on a few uh, uh, not interviews, um, acting jobs, where I've I was a uh, one I, I was a homeless <laughs> guy. And I was a uh, I played a lawyer and I was uh, worked in a doctor's office. I, I just some bit parts and stuff, nothing yeah. new, memorable. But you know, I kind of was kind of getting a little more into it. And man, that's a that's a pretty shady, scummy business. It's a it's a dude. That's a tough business. Tara said, "Don't forget about Sherini." And that's right, Sherini and I played with him in Glam Nation, and he's he's a great friend. Oh, Glam Nation! Like, I, I always it, thought that was the greatest name. It, that was all Eric Singer. I will never because if if this gets out that I came up with the name, I'll get <laughs> he'll, he'll go after me. But yeah, but it was it was it was it was a good time. It was all the glam songs, Mata Hoople, and it was all Eric's yeah. idea. So you acting is a tough, tough, tough one. It's, yeah, it's, it, it really is. And you know, I, it was interesting because I go, I, I went on. Uh, I, it was a handful of jobs. I probably did five things, and and, and it was like. Uh, and then I did a couple of things where I was, I was an extra, you know, and seven yeah. years and 75 bucks. Thanks. But I like being around that, that vibe and stuff. And I, it was a real challenge to do, to go and okay. Uh, you're a home, homeless guy. And there's like five of us who were playing homeless. Okay. Can you walk, just walk across the street and you go, okay, no big deal. So we all, we start walking. They go, Oh, cut, 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 cut. <laughs> walk like a, a zombie. You're homeless. You're not a zombie. <laughs> And there's a, I go, I never thought there was a difference, you know? and, <laughs> but, I, but I enjoyed it, you know, and I, it's, I still get it's tough. Books, uh, it's emails, tough. and I've checked some things out, but you know. Well, Johnny Depp was over to, he was able to cross over from, because he's originally a musician. People don't realize that. Yeah, you know? yeah, he was. Rock City Angels. He he came. Yeah. He had that band, The Kids, and he came mm -hmm. over there, and uh, he was. And the whole acting thing just fell into his lap on accident. They said, hey, man, you know, mm -hmm. and that was when he uh, he ended up getting on 21 Jump Street. That's right. And it's like he he was never like pursuing acting. It just fell in his lap. And what a great actor. Yeah, yeah. Like, come on, Donnie Roscoe. Donnie Roscoe, come on. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was, man, Blow, that movie is phenomenal. <laughs> Incredible, incredible. It's, it's funny. He looks like Robbie Crane in that movie. I always think of Robbie Crane when I watch Blow. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind next time. <laughs> you know? Okay, so we got number four. We got back to, we got five is is the Ramones. We got number four, Warrant, which another act you played with, and which is pretty yeah. cool. I, and, I mean, uh, I've been a drumming whore, man. I was I, I played with a lot of people, man. And uh, I, for Quite a few years, I was kind of a go-to guy to to do an album. They go, "Oh, call Kotak because he can." I could, I'd go and knock out an album in, in like three days, because I'd show up pre totally prepared. I'd learn the stuff, I had charts and all that stuff, and um, so very fortunate, man. Very, yeah, very, man. Yeah, man. very lucky. Yeah. And from one thing leads to another, leads to another, and you know, I'm very proud to say. I mean, I'm on about probably about 130 plus album CDs, whatever you want to call them these days. It's incredible. You know, vinyl, vinyl just outsold CDs for the I know last year. I know, I know. very it, it's very cool. But you know what, man? It's the stuff you got to do, you're on a lot of records too. So it's very yeah. cool. Jay, you know what? We go number number um four is Warren. What's a what's a a, a, a great memory that you could share with Janie Lane? With oh God, I, well, I <laughs> well, I don't know if you call this a great one, but he was he would do stuff where he'd sneak up, sneak up on you and just punch you in the arm. Really. 
<laughs> and this, this isn't so much a good memory, but it's one that really sticks out. We're on the tour bus and, you know, you end up, you know, we're driving, it's late at night and everybody's kind of had a few and whatever. And I'll never forget it. He, uh, <laughs> He, he had Rick Steyer, our guitarist. He, I'm in, say I'm sitting in the front lounge. Well, Rick's on the floor and Janie's on top of him, like strangling him. I mean, the, Janie's really, was really strong guy. And, you know, I go, no big deal. And Rick's like, oh, he's really strangling me. So I go to help him. And I bet I go <laughs> down and I, I go yeah, to pull Janie's hands off. And I, I kind of look up and right then Janie goes, poof, it headbutts me. Here and breaks my nose, and uh, oh. and I was like, going, I mean, I was a few into it, so I didn't really feel much till the next day. And then, man, I walked around looking like a raccoon for the next few weeks. Oh my god, I mean, we laughed about it later, but at the time, it sucked. At the time, were you pissed off at the time? Did you go, What the hell's wrong with you? I, I, what are you gonna do? He was on, yeah. on fire, man. He would just go to the front of the bus, the back of the bus, and just mess with people. And uh, it, it, I mean, it's cool, you know, it's he's kind of a, one of those guys he's hard you know, it was hard to get mad at him because he's so most of the time you know yeah super cool guy. but that was that was one that sticks out to me and not so much that's a good memory but man we played some great gigs man we toured we we went over to europe and we were all over america many times so, wow very cool very yeah. cool are there songs from when you were playing with him that Never, never got released, and uh, that you wrote maybe not with too them? many. They went on ultraphobic, but he had so many songs. He was a songwriting machine, and he would just go out there with these four track, put them down, and here, check this one out. Boom. Is that what he do? Yeah. He'd use an old school four track. Is yeah. that what he would do? Yeah, Sit he there. Call, he had this little uh, hut out in the backyard, and uh, he'd go out there and and because um, he was in that house for for quite a while, and then he had a, another house uh, a few miles away. We'd go over there sometimes. And he'd be out in the kitchen with a boombox and a guitar. Oh, and that's cool. how he'd present his songs. You're a this one. That's and then, cool. It was always, he just was a great man. Wow. You know? Wow. That's cool, man. That's cool. Very cool. Man, yeah. Great songwriter. Great songwriter. Can never take that away, you know? Mm -hmm. So, no. So we got, we got number three, ACDC, Back in Black, Brian Johnson's. Planetary. Uh, legendary. Leg legendary record. Oh. And then we got number two. Scorpions fifteenth studio fifteenth studio album released in two thousand four on Unbreakable, which you, yeah. you got the right with the legends over there of rock. How many yeah, how many oh records God. how many records did you do with Scorpions? Well, I did the uh, Out of Eye, the orchestra record, the Acoustico record, and we toured on both of those records all over the place. And I, and what we we continued doing then we did uh we play some rock shows for like. A, a few months then we go back and do acoustica and then we do some orchestra and we, we rotated for quite a few years doing that and a lot of people didn't even know it and we toured russia with the orchestra doing an orchestra thing and it's a different orchestra in each, each city but they had all the music and we go and do a sound check rehearsal and next thing you know so the, the sorry <laughs> the 2000 uh i mean i'm sorry the god dang it was the first the first time uh, I die, um, the orchestra, the acoustica, unbreakable. Then uh, there was a couple, a lot of things along the way. Then um, what was the name of the album with that? The one that stuck in two thousand eight. Ah, dang it! God, you've done so many. You can't remember. I love it. I, I, uh, I no, I know it. <laughs> um, that was the one we did with Desmond, Desmond Child, and then. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm like drawing a blank. And then we did uh, a couple more. <laughs> I, I don't know. True. Look it up. Oh, James I'll, I'll, I'll have, have to look it up. Not you. I mean, anybody out in radio. Yeah, any, anybody out there. And, uh, Desm but working with Desmond Child, that's another. Oh, my God. I, another. It was five great songwriters. Desmond, James Michael, Marty Fredrickson, of course, you know, Aerosmith and whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, two other heavyweights. And it was just like, wow. And uh I think Diane Warren was involved in a few of those too. Huge, huge, yeah. huge one. Ugh, God, you have to work with some incredible people in the I, business, man. You're very, very, very day, man. great. Fortunate. Well, you're, you're, you know what, James? You're an incredible musician yourself, and, Thank and you. you deserve it. And uh, now we got number one. James's pick, 
for today is Grand Funk, the live album, which the ladies in the audience love that one. And uh, it's, a gr it's a great record. It's, it's not it really is. They were commercial. At the peak. I think they were at the peak at that point. And they were also christened the loudest band in the world for like two years in a row, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> you know what's crazy about them? They're not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, dude. You know, speaking of, uh, I know that's a shame. They should be. Um, I got a, a message from, or Scorpions put out a thing about uh, wanting people to say something or whatever, blah, about Scorpions being in, in, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And um, they're asking people to sign something. I don't know. So if you see anything about Scorpions, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, please sign it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's been that's... talked about for years. I mean, you know, like, for at least 10, 12, 12 years before I was at, not in the band anymore. I mean, it's being talked about. It just, you know, it, it's a, a pretty big commitment. Everything you it's involved get leading up to it and doing it and all that. Yeah. Well, yeah. It will happen that's, sometime, but hopefully soon. That's crazy. The Scorpions are not in the Hall of Fame. It's crazy. Grand Funk. Who knew? There's, I, there's probably a, a list of great bands that should be in and aren't. It's, 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 I don't know who's voting or what they're doing, you know, the people that do make it in there, but it, that, that's insane. But everybody, this is James Kotag and I got, hey. I got, a, you know what he great. I'll put links for James in the description down below. We'll make He's sure still. James. Yeah. We'll make sure you come back again. And Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll hey, talk man, hey, St Stefan, Stefan, not Stefan, Stefan, you could, whatever. I don't care. Stephen, I don't care. Yeah. It's been a real pleasure. And, uh, and, Oh, and yes, I did write a book. Uh, I haven't put it out yet. I'm, I've been messing around with it for a few years. But I, I, I wrote it uh, 190 pages by hand, front and back, and it's it's really good. It covers everything. You, you got to put me, it out. That would be boring. You got to um, put it out. Let me, before we get out of here, to make okay. sure, because I want to make sure um, you, any webpage, any any um, links where people want to get your music or get any information from you, where can they go? You know what? Uh, my website is being revamped. That's jameskotek.com. But it, I'm sure we'll be back here in, in 10 minutes or so. And then, uh, you know, um, just, again, look at my discography and my Kotak albums are on my website. But I think you, you can get them through Amazon or wherever. And um, um, so, you know, it's it just... Google my name, I guess, and then find it through there. Or write to me and I'll get everybody over there. Look, Xandra wants a part two. So we'll have to do that. Debbie over here. Yay. Stephen and James. Look, Yay. Tara, Yay. look at this. Yeah. This was fantastic. Yeah. Thanks right over here. Fantastic interview. I'm, I'm glad you guys, you know, all yeah. have joined us over here. The Rock Hall of Fame shame is all politics. Oh, yeah, you know what? You're right. We can't get political. We can't fight can't fight the system sometimes. You just all you can no, do is just this is great. It, it, you know it's there's so much wacky stuff going on and it's just great to talk rock and roll. And, it, it is great. It's a great you know, interview. James is yeah, a great guy with so lots of stories better. right over here. And look at this and James. Also for everybody out there and anybody listening, whatever feel free to hit me on my Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. And I really do respond to most uh messages. Um, you know, if not right away within a, a few days, because I mean, that's that it keeps things interesting on my end, too. And, and I've, I, I, it helps me remember a lot of things I forgot. <laughs> uh, it's good. It's it, it's good. And uh, also, if there's any questions in here before we get out of here, put it in here before we slip out of here. Did you have for James and then uh, James in the future? What, what can we what, what do we see? You know, now you, you get your back and all that together for right now, but kingdom come down the road or what's well, absolutely going on? kingdom come. And then, uh, you know, I've talked to a couple of people about a couple projects that I can't really say. Um, but I, I'm, I would love to, and, and there's always something pop, popping up around the corner. And, you know, I was asked about doing a tour. Unfortunately, sometimes you get asked to do a tour and you actually don't like the band's music. So I'm not going to do something like that. No. I, I mean, because, you know, you always have to, you know, work and, you, you know, got to make money, you know, like everybody else. And, um, you know, I, 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 there's a, another Kotak album. I mean, I've got songs like crazy. And uh, and trust me, I don't get rich off of those albums, you know, and they're lucky to go nickel. Because yeah. none of them are ever going to go cold. <laughs> no, but you, you, so, you know what? You, you're, you're a great songwriter as well, man. Well, thank you. And you, you've proven yeah. that to get your music that. on on. The people the music we all love out there yeah. and, and uh, 
Thanks for sharing the story, saying thank you for coming on here. We'll do a part two for sure with James. And and not only that, now I got his cell number, not his cell, I got his number, and uh, I'll be I'll be busting his chops and be calling all the time because. Uh, oh, great! Especially call at like three in the morning. That's I'll, the yeah, hey James, what are you doing? I forgot to ask you a question on my show. Can you answer it right now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, I'll let you get going, James. Thanks right, a lot, brother. man. Let's speak sooner than later. Okay. Absolutely. And it's been a real pleasure, man. And, uh, and, uh, you know, that's it. That's it. We'll say goodbye to everybody. Don't go nowhere, James. Before we sign off, everybody, this is James right here, James mm -hmm. Kotek. And this was his top five. You got to see it uncut, unedited, unfiltered. If you like these shows, everybody, the way it's like this, this is what I do in Patreon. I don't normally do it like this. So join Patreon. It helps the cause. Uh, this week we'll be having Wednesday. Well, legends over here legends just look up yeah, there okay yeah. we have holly knight janice ian it's all gonna be special vip full patreon episodes unedited unfiltered the conversation that you won't hear on youtube but you hear it over there and then uh everybody um that's it i'm stefan awesome. you, you guys are all beautiful that's james remember who loves you yeah that's it james don't go nowhere we'll do our outro over here remember everybody it's only rock and roll james likes it i like it remember who loves you maybe we do until then <laughs> We'll see you later. Now get out of here, you crazy awesome. kids. <laughs>